Okay, uh, we are gonna get started. We're uh, just a couple minutes past 6.30, so. Uh, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. The first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, my understanding is that from the advertised um, agenda that we are removing the, the zoning fixes, which was item seven. Correct. Um, and our w I'd like to propose that we add two items to the end. Uh, yep. One a discussion, likely an executive session regarding pending litigation, just to update for us to talk about the parking garage appeal. And a second one um, dealing with a personnel disciplinary action. Both should be brief. Okay. Any further changes to the agenda? So we'll consider the uh, agenda approved um, without objection. Um, so general business and appearances. This is a time for um, anyone from the public to address the council on a matter that is otherwise not on our agenda. And I'm, I'm gonna take this opportunity to just say, I think the, the outside doors should be, or the, the one in the back anyway now, should be open. So that's, that's good. Um, any comments from the public? Okay, hello. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're gonna move on. Um, so the consent agenda, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. Second. second. <laughs> we got battling seconds. Grace. Um, okay, uh, further discussion about the consent agenda. All right, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? So motion carries. All right, city infrastructure. So this is a, uh, uh, actually an item that was requested by Councillor Hill, um, as we are yes. uh, we had some uh, recent water main issues, and so we'd love to just chat about where we're at. Welcome. still on your feet. <laughs> Snow, yeah. rain, yeah. and, and said water everywhere. We said it before, but please do pass on our just deep gratitude to your department. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it certainly goes to all the, the people of the department, including the gentleman in front of us, Tom, was up almost 18 hours, one of these nights, personally handling one of the leaks. And Kurt was, and Kurt was there with him at least one of those nights. So it was from the top to the bottom. Not the bottom. Yeah, there's certainly all hands on deck. We're sorry for all the inconveniences from all the motor breaks and oil well notices and everything. Well, it's all your fault, you know. <laughs> well, I had something to do with it. <laughs> you were out there with your sledgehammer. Bad luck guy. <laughs> Yeah, one night was um, in Nelson Street. Was, um, we had two, two breaks simultaneously, tried to fix them both at the same time. Uh, give our uh, thanks to a bike path contractor who came to our aid, uh, Jay Hutchins. So Kurt and I and a couple guys from the water plant became water crew um, division members while the other crew was working on the Bingham Street leaks. So it's, it's been uh, certainly tough. Um, I appreciate the community's support. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, expressions of gratitude um, from cookies to gift cards to uh, so a lot of people know what what, uh, what it takes, what they're going through. Um, and um, hopefully that's over, but it's uh, for now. But um, as we'll discuss tonight, we've, um, um, we have a, um, a water system that has uh, a number of challenges. It's, uh, not as though we haven't um, we've been neglecting it. Uh, in fact, we've been working on water system improvements since the 1970s. So it is a very old system. There's uh, many miles of, of water main. So, um, Kurt prepared a, uh, a memorandum. Uh, first of all, I'm Tom McCardle, Director of Public Works. This is Kurt Monica, Assistant Director and City Engineer. I'm most familiar with our water system, so it over to Kurt to uh, know you just received this memo uh, today. Um, so understand if you haven't read it. So we'll, we'll uh, briefly touch on that. We have a couple of, um, I think, very revealing um, um, charts, graphs um, that will explain what, what we've done. And over to Kurt. 
right, so um, we thought we'd start with a little bit of background about um, if, if this is an unusual year as far as the number of leaks we had um, compared to previous years. And um, uh, one chart, so we've had data going back to 2012 from our asset management software, which tracks um, work orders related to water leak responses. Um, and just to, just quickly to run through the years, in 2012 we had uh, 15, a total of 15 leaks. So it jumped up to 33 leaks. Yeah. This one, this one has the totals on it, oh, and that okay. one is the, the graph so, that relates to temperature. So on average, um, you know, we're in the mid 30s from 2013 uh, to 2015. It dropped off a little bit in 2016 to 26 total down to 16 in 2017, and then last year we jumped back up to um, 33, which sort of seems to be roughly our average annual number of leaks. I just interrupt for a second. On the scale of magnitude, these range from a leaking valve pipe to the more catastrophic leak failure of a pipe, so requiring a system shutdown. These don't differentiate the, the various types of water system failures. So does, does the number <clears throat> correspond with the, the, the intensity, the, the one, the five, the four, the just number of actual breaks in that month? Uh, the little tiny numbers above the Right, floor. those are the, the number of leaks in that month. Okay. So like, like Tom said, um, this isn't necessarily an unusual year in the number of leaks, but uh, this year happened to be two um, really significant leaks fairly close together, which uh, I think the public, you know, really took notice of um, the impact because uh, when we have large leaks like that, we have to issue the boil water notices, um, you know, which directly affects residents and businesses. So uh, briefly, just the, just some of the causes of the water leaks that we um, experience. Um, one is frost action. So this, this graph, um, the red line is the uh, temperature, and you can see not always, but often the number of leaks corresponds to the drop in temperature of the colder months. Um, that's when we get more frequent um, leaks. So as the ground freezes and thaws, um, things move, um, pipes become brittle and, and that can lead to leaks. Uh, another issue we experience is um, pressure surges. So if there's a sudden uh, stop or start um, in water flow, that can cause a pressure surge to the system. And in Montpelier, we have uh, unusually high uh, water system pressures. Our normal operating pressures in the downtown are about 200 psi or pounds per square inch. So um, it's really quite high for a water system to be running at. So when you get these pressure waves um, for our system, they they really have a greater impact, um, starting at a, at a high pressure. Um, and the third that we've really seen in the last probably five years, the third cause of water leaks is corrosion. So Montpelier has a lot of clay soils and we've actually um, sent some of those, uh, some of the clay soils out around a leak out for testing and found that they are highly corrosive. Um, the ductile iron that was installed starting from about 1970 and uh, out through the 90s was the preferred pipe material um, for water main replacements. Turns out that that's very susceptible to corrosion. So um, we're seeing a lot of failures in our pipes, um, in the ductile iron pipes that were installed in that time frame, uh, due to the, uh, the corrosive soils we have here. Uh, Oddly, some of our older cast iron water mains are still in service, so 100 years old, and are not seeing that level of corrosion that the ductile iron is. Is, is that because of the material itself or, or the... Uh, it's a thicker wall. Thicker. And, um, but I'm, I'm not sure the actual difference, but... Um, yeah, but, uh, but they are the performing better. Iron, which makes the, the pipe more flexible, uh -huh. is, uh, apparently weakened the steel and made it more susceptible to the corrosive action. Yeah, it's got different, different chemical properties in the, in the steel, so it is more susceptible to corrosion, in addition to be thinner walled. So we're, we're now switching to what's called um, high-density polyethylene water mains. It's, um, it's sort of a malleable plastic pipe. It, you can bend it, it, it can flex, um, it can contract, it can expand, and, and it's not susceptible to a corrosion. Um, the, the downside is it is more expensive. 
Um, but we have done one project last year on the Gu Drive. Uh, it was our first <coughs> full uh, installation of that pipe material. Do those have warranties on them? Um, there, there are some warranty items, but generally those uh, are not beyond a year. Okay, thank you. The ductile iron pipe that we're seeing failure has been in the ground for 30 years or more um, with, that are you know, failing, so well beyond any warranty that would have been. And sorry, about the, it's HDP pipes that you're using now, is that right? Correct. Um, they're flexible. Do you, do you know how long they stay flexible? I have the idea that plastic gets more brittle over time. All right, so PVC is another uh, pipe alternative, and that does, uh, that can get brittle after you know, a lot of uh, expansion and contraction movements. HDPE, um, you know, one, one thing they look at when they're testing pipe materials is how many pressure surges it can take over time. HDPE has the highest uh, above PVC and ductile iron. Um, so from what we've seen, it could last 100 years. We, the uh, the new water main on um, Northfield Street is uh, PVC. Um, so again, we can get away from the ductile iron pipe. Uh, it is a thicker wall uh, pipe, and uh, it doesn't have the UV protection. It's meant to be buried. I think a lot of that brittle that you hear about is from um, ultraviolet uh, breakdown of the of the pipes. So they have they have a, a very long. Uh, in the ground really inert. I think a key takeaway from all of this, talk about the, the different ductile iron and all that, is that it's not necessarily the oldest pipes that are failing. And I think that's one of the things we heard often. You know, we have these old pipes that we haven't replaced, but it was it's a particular type or brand of pipe that was actually some of which were put in 30 years ago, <coughs> thinking at the time that was the best thing to use. That was what the standard was. So it's just so Elm Street, um, both Elm and uh, Nelson Street failures were ductile iron pipes. Uh, Elm Street, I believe, was uh, is about 48 years old. Right. I don't recall Nelson, but it's 40 to 50 years. And oddly, the Elm Street water main um, it was perfect. <laughs> Other than the long crack in it, <laughs> the external, there was no pitting, there was no corrosion on it. Internally, it was clean. Cement lining was all intact. Um, I believe that may have been related to a, a joint that it was connected to that caused a, a crack to radiate 11 feet down the pipe. Um, so that's there's a number of reasons and causes for these. I think the HDPE pipe is seamless, it's fused, um, and not susceptible to that type of crack. So one of the things that, um, one of the comments that I have gotten from people um, after that uh, you know, the series of breaks uh, was, you know, what is the city doing to be proactive about it? And uh, I know, you know, we have been uh, like with Northfield Street and I think Harrison a uh, couple, like last year or the year before or so. Um, you know, we've been uh, sort of preemptively going in there and, and you know, redoing some of the lines. Um, where can people expect us to be proactive um, this coming uh, I, I know I know the answer to this question, but just so that we can talk about it, um, so people know that you know we are um, planning on on fixing some of these lines um, before they before they have broken. Um, where where are we looking at for the coming season? All right. So um, this summer uh, we're planning to reconstruct Clarendon Avenue. Um, in addition to water main replacement, there's also um, sewer storm separation work uh, produced with those, um, and then you know the street rehab itself. So that's our really big um, uh, project for the summer. We also have a plan to do some in-house work. Um, most likely, I think we're going to look at Quesnel, which is the last, um, the last really significant galvanized water main that we have in the system. So our replacement has really been focused on worst first for water system work. Um, we're trying to get rid of all the galvanized pipe, which is uh, really prone to leaking. It's just very brittle, um, installed uh, probably in the 60s. So, um, so yeah, it would be Clarendon, hopefully Quiznell, depending on, um, you know, the work demands on our staff. But. Sure, great, thank you. That, is, that, uh, sorry. Uh, there, there is a water system master plan, um, and that's a number of, of mains are, are phased in, replacements, schedules are identified, funding levels. Um, 
So that's the, the plan we're, we're following. Um, rethinking that a little bit now, um, hopefully able to advance um, some other projects, but um, for example, East State Street. Um, several of the leaks on these graphs are East State School. Um, and uh, in fact, we st still have a, a minor leak on East State. We haven't found the, the actual location of it. Um, and that's even tougher in the winter because um, of the frost and doesn't always surface. So, um, so East State Street is part of a reconstruction plan um, presently uh, proposed in 2022. Um, there's a lot of sewer separation work, and um, so it'll be a, a, a reconstruction project. Um, that one street, uh, that was our really our first major leak of the season in November, and was the last leak of this series of leaks. Um, that was another early morning uh, project. Uh, so that's a that's one that we're we're really hoping to, to get moving along quickly. But Sooner than 2022. If we can, yeah. but it takes a couple of years to put these projects together. Um, there is some state funding assistance and the pollution control grant that we're applying for. Um, so there's there's quite a bit of preparation work to put a project right. together like that. Um, Ashley, and then I hope to move on soon. Okay. Oh, and, and then Rosie. Yeah. Uh, so that was actually one of my questions. Um, it seems like so. I can think we had one on East State over the summer. We had one at the at the upper end, almost in the same place. Um, was that maybe December? I'm assuming it's on this. And then we had two on Lower East State. Is that right? This this winter. So I'm just I'm curious to see. I know I know that that's been in the works for a while, and I know it's slated for 2022, but um, I'm just curious if, if there's any sort of flexibility in, in redetermining and, and what kind of support you would need for the council to allocate or, or if, if there is a, a way to sort of address that, because that seems like a, a constant problem area. It sounds like there's still something that we just can't find where because of the weather, but um, I'm just curious if, if that if there is a plan to reevaluate the timing on on some of those more critical areas. Well, we're starting to talk about some ideas. I need to start thinking out of the box. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we're we're limited trying to um, be mindful of our um, the the costs the ratepayers paying um, outside funding uh, potential. Um, there is a bond uh, scheduled in the master plan for additional work that would cover that one project as well. Um, but looking at other alternatives um, that might be available to us, we start to think a little bit out of the box on how we can advance that, that project. But again, it takes, correct me if I'm wrong, um, a couple of years to put that project together. Um, there's planning, there's design, there's survey, um, there's permits. Um, so a two-year project um, advancement is, is a fast track. Type of project so. and and I know you already said this but just to remind everyone with that because this isn't just a fixing of water means water sewer CSO and a complete rebuild of the road so it's a major That's it's correct. a smaller version of the Northfield Street project that, that we did and reminder that we're going to be upgrading our sewer plant our wastewater plant which is a very major problem project is going to take a huge amount of Kurt's time just on that coming up so but we are talking about some funding Systems to maybe speed this up. Right, we are looking at the um, the clean the state revolving loan fund, which has a series of engineering steps you have to follow to get eligibility. So um, just to get through that process is, is about a year, um, which which I will be um, applying for funding through that this week. Is the plan just to get that process started. So yeah, we will bump it up if we can. Absolutely, it is a priority for us. Rosie. Um, a couple of thoughts and questions. Um, one is I was a little bit concerned about um, the loss of water for some of our larger customers who are located up high, specifically U32 and National Life. Um, and I wanted to know if we kind of thought about doing any outreach to them about the work we are taking to make the steps we are making to, to make sure that that doesn't continue to happen because I know the U32 had to close for a couple days because of the boil water notice and the loss of pressure and I have 
no knowledge that they're they're considering this or thinking about this, but if I was in that position of a large customer um, up high who might feel like my service from Montpelier had become less reliable, I might start thinking about what my alternatives are. And so we certainly don't want to lose those customers, and so I think it would be good for us to kind of do some proactive outreach and say, hey, we realize this was an inconvenience. This is what we're doing to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, we had a similar situation on Northfield Street with Westview Meadows. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of conversations with them. It's a really a, similar to a hospital yeah. facility, and um, the, the public outreach or the outreach with that organization began, and, and uh, we were able to advance to get that project. And we thankfully haven't had those types of problems. I have spoken um, actually throughout the the Elm Street failure. Um, was in regular contact with the National Life Facilities Director. Um, let them know what we're doing. Um, really, that was a, um, a short-term shutdown. We had trouble, because it's such a large water main, mm -hmm. um, shutting that down completely. Uh, they actually had water back fully restored by, I believe, 8.30, 9 o'clock that morning. Um, but they had already made the decision to clear out. So, um, so we have been communicating, um, at least through the facilities director, but I think it's smart that we also mm -hmm. reach out um, further uh, yeah. to discuss that. And I, I noticed that the, there's text in here about how the boil water notices have changed, but, and I'm not really sure how that impacts some of those large customers. If there is a boil water notice, they can't, you know, can they have, for example, head of school open, that sort of thing. So maybe that's part of what's happening here is that mm -hmm. because we we are now issuing more of the boil water notices in accordance with state regulators that that's causing additional problems for them. So just to I, I think that's a choice of the schools. I know Montpelier School okay. stayed open. I don't know whether I know U32 was closed the day of the break. Um, Montpelier School stayed open, but after that, I can't remember if they closed because of the boil water notice or not. I but was I know under the impression that they were closed another day, and I thought it was because of that, but I could yeah, be. Yeah, I don't I, secondhand. So. I had heard that it was just because they couldn't flush toilets the first day. Yeah. Yeah, but then I don't know about the second day. Yeah. So. So we also just didn't have a lot of communication during the water breaks with our um, water plant operators. Because you were but, all out there. <laughs> well, <laughs> we also have, you know, talked to them about sampling mm -hmm. the timing of it yeah. so and, and the leak when we're going to restore it. Um, just one note on what we're doing to sort of uh, hone in on boil water notices. So they're required when pressure drops in the system below 20 PSI. Um, we don't have a, um, a pressure monitor on Gallison Hill. We don't have a gauge that tells us what the pressure is that we can read remotely and trend. So we're gonna, um, you guys will be seeing a proposal soon um, to add that. There's a, an old booster station that's heated and enclosed. Uh, it's halfway up Gallison Hill that the city owns that we can pretty uh, economically install a pressure transmitter there. And we'll know when they lose pressure when they know because uh, when they don't. And so hopefully that will help to reduce the number of uh, boil water notices for yeah. the facility because we can't now verify when they lose pressure. So that would be the perfect sort of thing to communicate with them and say, hey, we're, we're, we realize that this was an issue and we're doing something. Um, all right. First thing we had to do, though, is to put all this plan together and then yeah. just had to reach out. <laughs> so um, we've had a debriefed after all of this. Um, and so I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but we need to first come up with a plan and then understand that it actually will work. Uh, we have spoken with um, uh, another consultant as well, uh, two consultants, one a, a systems engineer for our plant uh, for some of these remote readers. Um, some of the options we're looking at, um, which is described in this report, but um, we have a um, kind of a shock absorber idea, um, mm -hmm. pressure relief system. So when these hammers, and it could be a fire that causes a tremendous surge of, surge of water and then it shut down abruptly, uh, can cause, cause that pressure wave to uh, go through the system. I think Nelson Street, because it was such a catastrophic loss of water, um, they shut it down quickly and they felt a 10 PSI uh, pressure wave up at the plant. So one of the things that uh, we're looking at is uh, the two um, uh, booster pump stations, um, um, dialing those down from a 20 PSI down to a 5 where it would relieve that pressure. So we've learned a lot from this um, and I think we have some, some good things we can do. Um, pretty immediately and then more longer, longer term plans and then we'll get that out. But. Great. Um, two other things I wanted to note. Um, one is, you know, you talked a little bit about funding and I just want to remind this council, because you may not have 
the new folks might not have thought about this um, much, that how important it is to make sure that we charge all of this uh, water work to the water fund to ensure that the water rate payers, including folks like the state and some other folks who don't pay taxes, um, although they do pay uh, pilot instead, um, that they are fairly and fully charged for those costs because this is our mechanism of making sure that our, our water customers do pay for the costs and some of those water customers are the very large customers. Um, so just to flag that for, for fellow counselors. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to think about a little bit was my understanding is that some of these kind of extreme temperature fluctuations going back and forth, that those cause breaks more frequently. And is, is that a correct yeah, assumption? Yeah, right. So that's, that's really what this chart yeah. is illustrating, is that the temperature changes in correlation to the frequency of leaks. So I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, with climate change, is this something, you know, we have our, our plan and, you know, our, um, of how we're going to be addressing all of these issues, but do we need to be thinking about um, putting a little bit more money towards infrastructure in order to address these issues? And maybe this is a real cost of climate change, and we need to take that into our steady state planning. Um, so not something to decide tonight, but just something to flag. Great. Further comments? All right. Thank you so much, and uh, look forward to seeing how it all you know works out with the funding and um, you know looking forward to the work getting done so thank you okay so the north branch east yes uh, I think the um, as you recall we had a discussion about we, we've, it's what we've ended up calling the former Vermont Association for the Blind, the former MOAT, and the former TKS properties, the three properties that the city owns. We had some discussions in the fall about should we continue with the development plan for those? Should they become open space or what should we do? Uh, you directed me to look at options and come back with a recommendation. I pulled together a working group of some stakeholders. I think you've been kept in the loop of those meetings and uh, the notes from those meetings. So uh, and I just tried to pull together all of those as one big summary for you with um, basically a, a, the final conclusion, which is basically that we said, uh, let's do some master planning before, you know, we're spending a lot of time over a very small period of, uh, of excuse me, a very small piece of land uh, we're getting kind of worked up without thinking of this in the context of the whole. So let's take a look at a downtown master planning effort. Uh, that would, Oh, and I see some folks snuck in from the group, so please jump in if there's anything <laughs> you have to add. Um, and that um, what we should do is think of an interim solution that doesn't preclude either the development plan or the creation of, of um, green space and which perhaps in the short time does open up some more uh, open space that, that wouldn't have otherwise existed. So one of the, uh, I think what we came up with for guiding principles was keep the lot, the development lot open, put whatever pavement, road pavement that was going to be would have to go through where the parking lot was going to go. So if we, if we went back to plan A, we wouldn't be, you know, we'd only be paving where there's already going to be pavement. And that we had to have a functioning road, of course, going back in. So after I think people got on board with that. We've got a draft of that plan. Um, we can make some final tweaks. We took a look at rough costs. This is not in your memo. I just actually got these numbers recently. Uh, currently, we're estimating about $600,000 to construct the, the original plan. Um, we think it'll be about $535,000 to construct the interim plan. Uh, now, so that's a savings of $65,000 to be note that we only pay 10% of that. So it's really only saving to the city of $6,500, just so we're clear. If we were to then uh, go back and put everything back the way we were going to do it in the first place, it would probably be another $150,000 all coming from the city to go back and do the original plan. So while it'll cost a little less to do the interim plan, we will then bear the cost of putting it back because we'll be redoing some work. Um, that obviously could be perhaps the cost of uh, a, de a developer if they were going to go do that. And obviously, if there were to be a park or something else put in, then, then those costs, including the repayment to the state, uh, would be involved. This has not yet, I mean, pending on waiting to see whether, whether this was a, uh, an area that you all wanted to pursue. If it is, then our next stop will be to review this plan with state and feds and make sure they're, they're on board with this. But that's... Um, 
that's really all I have to offer and that I think it's all otherwise it's all in writing as I said I see Elizabeth I see um, MDC here Laura's here uh, Corey of course was our key staff person on this and Tom so if any any of them want to weigh in happy to have them uh, I want to make just one comment yes. That and Donna attended but the all these different stakeholders came together, lots of different opinions, and right away, given some comments, particularly from uh, Greg, people fell in line that rather than to fight over these bits of little property to really work at a similar aim. And that was really, I really liked the process. You all did good work. Thank you. And Bill, you led it. <laughs> good people in the group. Just jumping in, great comments. So, Laura Gephardt, the executive director for the Mockbillier Development Corporation. So, as part of that group, um, I just wanted to kind of touch upon some of the points that Bill made, um, especially around this idea of a master plan. And Greg was the champion around this concept. Um, it was just really interesting that we had very diverse perspectives in the room, um, which is great because it brought in different values to this one piece of property, but we also quickly realized that we can't determine these uses in a case-by-case case basis. They need to be embedded in this bigger picture, um, which ideally includes all these different perspectives. Um, so I'm encouraged, and I hope that you agree with kind of this temporary use plan until a master plan can be put in place. Um, the last kind of full-scale downtown master plan that was done was the Ma Capital District Master Plan from 2000. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to look at that, it's super interesting, and I sent it to Jack. Um, there's a lot of projects that come to fruition, um, and a lot of projects that are on the cusp of happening um, that are in there. Um, and that's just a really great kind of base copy. We can update that and integrate sustainability goals, economic development goals, all these different things that right now or with that group we are trying to parse out again with this one small piece of land. Um, so I'm hoping we can kind of get to that bigger picture and then start to implement these things on different properties um, in a very cohesive way. Thank you. Uh, Rosie. Can I just clarify, Bill? So you said $150,000 to go back and do the original. I'm a little confused because I, th looking at the current, uh, the, the suggested plan, it looks like it would still allow us to go and put a, you know, break off a lot and have it, a building it there. It will, but and Corey, you're going to have to save me, save me here, buddy. Um, <laughs> uh, but once we've created it, then we still have to go back in and put in pavement. I think there's some drainage things that have to be done. You've got, you know, other connections to do. So if we do it all right now, while we've got the contractor there, it's one cost. If we then build something else, even though we, we're doing it, the, I think the most efficient way we can. There's still going to be cost to come, come back, mobilize a contractor back to do the work and undo some of what we've done. I mean, I think it's the least disruptive thing we could come up with, but it's not free to then put it back. So, but we would still be it would still be somewhat changed from the prior plan because the road is in a slightly different location. It is, but the road goes through where all the pavement was going to go. Uh-huh. So the road's going to be pavement, so it would um it could still be expanded. We might have to redo the base to to deal with the sloping and that kind of thing, but the the road could be moved once I guess I'm not really explaining that. I'm not very really well. So, but the 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 advantage I see of this plan is that it actually would allow us to potentially still have a lot on the front part of the space, a building Correct. lot, while still having more park space on the back so, of the lot. So there's, right. And so that more park space is not. So one option. Well, hang on, do, I want you to be able to finish your thought. What were you saying? So when we say to, if we were to go back to the original plan, we're, we wouldn't be talking about taking that additional park space on the back of the lot and paving that over. We would just be talking about separating off the front of the lot and selling that as a building lot. Right. So so those are actually two different plans. So yes, okay. the cost to go back to the original plan is to do exactly what we were going to do, which was mm -hmm. pave further back. Yeah. So that's that you that's correct. It, we could potentially just leave it the way it is, put the building in the building lot and have the expanded <coughs> green space in the back. One of the things we don't know about that is how if 
that number of parking spaces makes a building viable. That's one of the things that needs to be looked okay. at in the future. The, the cost for the 150 is, just to be clear about that, is to actually go back to the exact plan we were going to build in the first place. So you're right, that would be a, an expansion of paved space. So in the scenario that it did, a building was still viable with fewer parking spaces then and it we wouldn't, wanted we to just, sell the lot, it would just be, correct. it I think that's right. More. Yeah. Okay, that helps. Uh, Connor, and then Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Okay, we'll go Elizabeth and Connor. <laughs> oh, oh, interesting. Anyway, I just want to say, ditto. Um, the process was a really good one, so thank you. And um, I think we a uh, very complicated scenario situation um, quickly and productively. And I think it's a good lesson for us to remember as we move ahead into the planning process with the uh, planning commission. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I may have missed the bill. The 18 temporary spots are they metered? We they can be. We, we okay. I, I, our group got really more into the design of the space. I think that's a that would be a policy decision for us. I think the input. Rosie had asked me also about why we came up with 18, and there's no magic to that number other than we. we we have 18 new housing units going into North Branch, which are which are using up to 18 spaces in that parking lot. So we thought, at the very least, if we can replace those, there was also some notion that if we took out parking on Barry Street to put in a bike lane, that's 17 or 18 spaces. So we kind of hovered around that as a, a number that was important to maintain in, in light of other activity. I, I'm, I personally would assume that they would be metered or permit spaces like they would be kind of be an extension of the parking lot out back, but to be determined. Do you know how much that generates then if it was metered? I, I bet we could find that out. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I do. We do have a revenue projection of how much each meter brings in. So yes, there would be some revenue for, from this for parking. Uh, Rosie, go ahead. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm following clearly. I'm hearing master plan, and we just went through a process of talking about when we were going to do the master plan, are these the same master plan or is this a different master, downtown master planning process versus a, it would the, yes. Oh, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, about a month ago, about a month ago we uh, received a saying. municipal planning grant um, to do the state street, streetscape master plan. Um, and that, uh, there was $25,000 that we received to do this. When these discussions started started evolving, um, in I believe Mike was at that at that meeting as well. The idea was we might be able to expand the scope of that planning grant to include not just the streetscape, but to start to look at municipal properties um, that were controlled or leased adjacent to that area. Um, I spoke to the state and they said, yeah, they can do it. They didn't promise more money, but um, we're working on that. Um, so the idea is, is that if we've already engaged with a, um, a consultant, um, which is going to be a landscape designer, an urban planner, um, design firm, um, that's kind of an ideal time because you're engaging with the public to look at kind of the, the right of way. Um, and to just look at the adjacent areas will kind of give us that economies of scale when we've already engaged them. Um, so I've actually got the uh, RFQ ready to go. Uh, we just have to review it. Um, and we're hoping to get that engaged. But it is separate from our town master plan. Okay. This is a downtown master plan, Although, which we've talked about. just to be clear about this. So yeah, so the idea was do a state and made. And it just a little off track, but just a reminder, one of the reasons we're doing a state street master plan is because at some point we're going to have to replace the bridge the on bridge. the Rialto Bridge. And so when we do that, we want to have a plan for what, while the street's closed, what, what is it going back as? So we're trying to look ahead to that. But 
the idea being is that you know we have the the transportation the the Montpelier in Motion plan which talks about different bike lanes we have the, you know all these different plans so as as we do the master plan through the the planning commission is they will look at these sub plans and and take them all and develop those into a master plan because some of them of course have have conflicting ideas some are complementary ideas and so how do you you know and, and many of those groups were represented in in this conversation so i think that the idea is to lay out these segments and then have the planning commission look at them to create a whole so and any other comments um so my understanding is that we could use a motion something to the effect of um oh i have lost it uh i used to have it I know it's, it's right, right here, Henry. Um, so, to some kind of a motion to pursue the plan, the interim plan as uh, as presented, and um, I'll make a motion. Second. Oh, I was gonna read them. Oh. Yeah, go. You go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> You're, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit. What, totally what you say is so good to me, Rosie. <laughs> <laughs> Anything I say. Um, I move that we direct the city manager to pursue an interim solution which will retain long-term options for either building or parking, open space, or some combination of both. And additionally, direct the city manager to con conduct a planning process which considers various needs and land uses throughout the downtown using the suggestions uh, that the, what was this group called? The, the, Our city the managers working city group, managers working group uh, came up with as a basis for this work. Okay, so oh, and so it's <laughs> <laughs> so just to, just to reiterate, so this is the plan that we want uh, for the interim, and we're going to conduct a um, further planning process about what will, should be their long term. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Laura and yeah. Elizabeth. Appreciate you coming. Okay. So now we are skipping the zoning fixes. Um, it's Mike uh, Miller is well, not Kevin able to join us. <laughs> We're talking about uh, revolving loan fund. Yes. Okay. Uh, Turn it over Kevin to you. Kevin wants to do zoning. <laughs> I do not want to touch zoning. <laughs> <laughs> Mike is. That's all Mike. Um, so uh, the issue tonight is the loan fund reorganization. Um, since the 1980s, the city has um, managed and maintained a number of revolving loan funds. They're in, in your memo. Um, most of these are a res result of community development block grant funds, which um, uh, were lent to certain projects and then uh, went back into repayment. Uh, the challenge has been with these revolving loan funds is that many of them um, uh, you know, were solutions to problems in the 80s um, or 90s. And as a result, when we try to apply these to existing um, issues, we don't really have the flexibility. So as a result, many of these loan funds are dormant. Um, and they accrue a mod modest amount of interest a year, but, but not a significant amount. And the plan has been is to say, let's realign these with our existing goals. So a couple years ago, we did the economic development strategic plan. And we know one of the suggestions in there was, let's start looking to find a way to, um, to create you know, loan programs or, and policies which are flexible, um, but also are valuable. What does a small business need in order to be successful? What, you know, how can we work with the banks to best leverage these funds? And so, um, actually, just recently, we, we had uh, Laura and Mike and, um, and I met with one of the local commercial bankers to have a discussion on what is, what is one of the best ways that we can do this. So he offered some great suggestions, and one of the, the things that we're hoping to do is to kind of continue those discussions. Um, to have a kind of a, a round table of, of lenders and local business people, uh, small businesses, entrepreneurs, and say, what is it you need? Um, because our existing business loan fund, for example, um, has restrictions that say things like, you can't have any access to existing credit, which could include credit cards. So back in the 1980s, when nobody had credit cards, there was not as many people, um, you know, I. I 
yeah, so basically we would be lending to people who um, are in such dire straits that no one would, have, would, would give them money. Your business is probably going to fail. So um, again, we, we haven't written many of these loans recently, um, mainly since like the 90s. So um, the goal is to actually take this, uh, to redirect some of these funds into one economic development fund. Um, what I'm, we're asking for tonight, specifically with each of these, housing, economic development, and, um, and the ADA fund, is to direct the city manager and direct staff to start having those, those substantive discussions to come back with a series of policies and guidelines which are, are developed with the, um, with the business community, for example, for the economic development fund. We're shifting some of the other money into, the, into a separate housing um, revolving loan fund. Um, and this is a result of we have um, programs which I think need to be, be looked at by the housing task force to say, you know, how effective are they? How can we best use these monies that are sitting in these accounts that are repayments from, from loans, um, from specifically housing preserva preservation grant loans, um, some of the funds come from um, CDBG funds for housing projects. So the the one of the the things that we're looking at is to say, let's let's relook at our programs so that they align with our housing goals. How do we create new units? You know, do we have a rehab program? Is that is that duplicate? Is it duplicative? Because there are other agencies which do it. How do we best use our time and resources? Um, so we've actually. Um, I brought a version of this memo to the housing task force um, to get their input on it, and um, and just recently, Polly has has offered to, you know, if if approved, to kind of go in this reorganization direction. She she's one person who's already volunteered to help work on these guidelines, so that we can come up with programs, and and it's kind of a really good timing um, coming up. Actually, I think at the next council meeting, we have um, a proposal for. Um, a program which um, a pilot program to do accessory dwelling units and it's a very exciting program uh, really exciting if you own a home like this is it's good stuff so <laughs> we but one of the challenges that we look into is that in this is that we need to come up with the matches so um, you know we're working with other partners um, at, at the state state housing authority and the and Vermont community development program to start to see like where we can we can leverage some of these local funds, and this would be one of those examples, um, and that fits. That's another example of saying, okay, let's make these funds more flexible. Still going to have council approval, but make these more flexible, and then you know when these opportunities arise, we have the opportunity to to go after these projects and programs um, flexibly and quickly, because I think that's going to be the key. So uh, I think this is great. I, I think this is, uh, it, it's somehow shocking to me that we have these balances that are really not being used. Um, and so if we can make that more effective and, and working for the city, that is wonderful. Um, one of the questions I have about this is, uh, um, so in the chart that you gave us, it's, it says, uh, you know, there's the rightmost column, intended purpose slash restrictions. So I'm sure this you've thought through this, but I just need to um, check in about it. Uh, the some of these some of this money it sounds like were you know came through grants or whatever, and they would have their own set of restrictions on them. Uh, and I assume that the the restrictions that are here may be a combination of restrictions that the council placed on those, yeah. or the restrictions that were that came with the grant itself. Correct. So some of these funds are. Um, have our self-imposed restrictions. So like, I can go through this really quickly. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, before you do that, my, really my question okay. is, uh, I just want to make sure that we have the authority to revamp the guidelines. We do. We, uh, we, in order to do this, um, we just have to go to the state um, that we re annually report on, on the existing funds, um, although we're, we're pretty low. We're, we're down to only really one or two that, that we actually report on. Um, and we just get a release. Uh, and generally speaking, what they're looking for is um, with the reorganization of, of revolving loan funds is, okay, you know, what's your plan to do with these balances? In, in some of these cases, um, 
you know, we, it, we've been in so many generations of repayment that even under the original grant agreement, we're not really under the restrictions. Um, they're essentially our own restrictions at this point. Okay. So um, there's going to be there's going to be a conversation with the state, and that's one of the, the pieces in this request on the last mm -hmm. page mm -hmm. um, is to, you know just to authorize us to to go through that process and 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 close out those remainders with the state. Okay. So Great. I'd like to make a motion to direct city manager, staff, and committees to prepare an updated guidelines for each of the proposed loan funds and to present updated guidelines and procedures for the council approval over the next three to six months. Yeah. Second. I love how efficient you are. <laughs> Team, we're doing great. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, further discussion? All, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good Seems night. Seems wonderful. Uh, okay. So on to the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee charge. I know we have a couple uh, folks, co-chairs yeah. from the committee here. Hi. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Julia Schaefitz. I'm a co-chair of the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Peter Kalman, co-chair. Do you, do you want to introduce the topic or do you want me to do that? Either way. You can do it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so we were charged or we were asked uh, to help uh, the, the committee um, clarify what their charge was. And so we have um, a document that uh, I think you all sort of came either came up with or have had some input on, right? Um, uh, as a as a you know draft for the the charge for this committee, um, and there, I think there's lots of great stuff in here. So, uh, do you want to talk at all about the thinking that your committee has done around uh, around your charge and yeah. how you came to this point? Or yeah, yeah. so um, that well, I will say that. Um, that charge is modeled on uh, charges from uh, from other city committees, just to looking at looking at uh, the structure <laughs> um, and and substituting in where we felt we could um, be successful and needed to address as a committee. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, in the work and since we formed as a committee, it's become clear that. Um, that having a, a clear charge is going to be really critical to pulling in the same direction and having um, having uh, having making change and making making headway on these issues, um, and so that the charge that I present or that I sent to you that you should have have now um, was not created by the full committee. It was. Um, it was sort of drafted uh, based on the energy committee's charge, um, and then um, <clears throat> I had individual meetings with with folks, and we kind of like worked on it individually. So the whole committee has not like, but I, but I think but everyone has looked at it, and everybody has weighed in on it, and um, I think will set us up well. Um, the other thing I want to say about it is that there is the kind of like official charge part and then the second piece of the document where there's some bullet points on the second half is more focused on is more uh, about specific activities that we that we would take on um, and maybe not all at once maybe not all in our first year of existence <laughs> um, but uh, the, the things that we can imagine making headway on great that yeah that's great and um, so you had written me an email too yes. about just like some vision yes. process. So, yeah so um, the other thing that um, became really clear um, in our last meeting, um, we had really broad consensus um, for, with everybody at the meeting that um, we were lacking a shared vision, and it seems like the city in general is lacking a shared vision and understanding of um, what is the current status of social and economic justice in our community, and possibly even what are the definitions of those terms. Um, and. Uh, what, what, where is it now and where are we heading? And that, that, even, that amassing such a vision, a vision um, it, I'm sure other people are having these conversations in various ways. Other organizations are having them at various scales and sizes at the state level, at the community level, at the central Vermont level. Um, but that having it specifically about Montpelier um, needs to happen and needs to be uh, an important first, that we can't start making policy recommendations until we have a shared vision of 
where are we now and where do we all want to be? Um, and that it really does need to be a broad community conversation that is um, as inclusive of, as possible, both of experts in the field that touch on, that are, that are working on these issues as well as um, individuals and, and groups that are affected. So um, that is what we are kind of starting to look at or sort of proposing that our, for our first 12 to 18 months of work from I guess not our first, but our next 12 to 18 months of work be focused around really um, not making specific broad policy recommendations, but really on, on amassing this vision and with the hope that eventually we will be able to make confident policy recommendations as a result. Super. Any comments, questions? No? OK. Uh, yes, Donna. Just a, a supplement. I got invited to a local neighborhood group of a dozen people, and we've committed ourselves to become more self-aware of, one, Black Lives Matter as an organization, saw a wonderful but short video of the three women who founded it and their interview and discussion, very expansive, and having been in women conscious raising groups in the 70s, yes, you weren't born then. Uh, <laughs> True. Some it's of true. us were. <laughs> Barely, Bill. But uh, anyway, I really, would be really interested if we could actually start generating a lot more of those. But one of the things I, I brought was to share with you and ask maybe Bill to share. There are some things of the, the six core things of Black Lives Matter and, and some resources in Burlington and Vermont that I give to Bill and you can share electronically. But we're going to actually start reading some books and some articles and see some documentatives. And, and I'm going to share as I go along, hoping that everybody can go on their personal journey mm -hmm. as we then look to a apply this knowledge to our policies. That's great. So I'll feed whatever I have into you if you can use it. Yeah, that'd be But great. I do think we have to do our own personal homework Absolutely. as well as in the community sharing that what we don't know and what yeah. we need to know. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Excellent. I'll give Thank this you. to you later, Bill. Okay. Quick question. Does the current composition of the committee reflect, I think, the diversity that you'd like to have, or do you think that needs to be a component of it to sort of recruiting some new committee members with different backgrounds? <coughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think, I think we could use some more diversity among the committee. Um, I think we. Um, uh, We've actually, the two newest members have added uh, like uh, diversity in terms of perspective and, and um, agency connections, which I think is really great. Um, and yes, we need to grow. I also um, would say that um, in my personal, I mean, we've started to talk about this, but in my personal vision of this committee that we also um, <clears throat> will need to rely on work we'll need to like this is going to need to be a community lift and so we will need to rely on work that's a already being done by folks in the community but also you know volunteers that come on for a, a project at a time that aren't folks who are going to take on joining the committee and staying on for the long haul but ad hoc as and and as needed and so i, I also hope that that's another place we can get in some diversity awesome. yeah all right uh so i think we need a motion on the charge. I move that we approve it. Second. Uh, okay, great. We have a second. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just uh, I want to make sure that we have the flexibility over time to change the charge. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, uh, if you wanted to change the charge, you probably have to come back to the council, but that is an option. Yeah, because I think. As we reach out into the community and hear from a broader range of voices in the community, we're going to have some disagreement about even a word. And that disagreement will be actually important to helping us understand social and economic justice better. So that I think a year from now, we probably could rewrite the charge in a way that would be the result of what we've learned, and I just want to make sure that this isn't written in stone. No, for sure. Um, that's fine. I also hope that whatever ha is, uh, you know, here or whatever you find you might need to change it to, is uh, empowering enough to uh, to your group to do the work that you want to do. And I, and in all honesty, I hope that is the focus more so than changing these words. 
but that's, <laughs> exactly, that's exactly why just... I wanted to say that because in our, I can't remember if it was our first meeting or our second meeting or both of them, we got so hung up on the words. Go ahead and get to the work. Yes. <laughs> it's great. It's important work it needs to happen. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. And thank you to your committee as well. Please pass that on. Will do. Yeah. Okay, the recreation feasibility study. Well, they are not They're here. not here. Interesting. They are, well, no, they actually are having a public presentation tonight. <laughs> six, and so they're coming from that to here. So we should just skip they it. Had actually, they had asked us to um, put it later in the agenda. We just are moving along so rapidly. Yeah, I'm anticipating, you know, we, I want to be done by 9.30. Okay, well, just, that should be easy. Well, with the, because we have some executive yeah, sessions, so yeah, I want to be done with, should, not. done with the public session at 9.30. That's my goal. Well, the public, we should be done by here. We're going to be done sooner than that, yeah. You guys are jinxing the whole thing. Well, um, Rosie Find just went to the bathroom, I think, so she's not here for the public message board. So we're going to jump to the community indicators. Does that sound reasonable? <laughs> yeah, that's yours. That's mine. We can talk about that. Okay, so it's been a little while since we talked about the community indicators. Um, the color coding, in case it's uh, confusing here, um, uh, the red uh, items were things that we added at, like, as a result of the conversation uh, that we had um, the last time. Some of the suggestions, it turned out, uh, were not terribly feasible, or they were the kinds of data that we, you know, that we didn't think anybody was collecting, or we didn't know of anybody um, was collecting. But there were a lot of great suggestions, and so uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of those got, ended up being added in um, to. Uh, to this list. Now, if there are other things that you see is that are, that are still absent, um, that is perfectly fine and would love to, um, you know, continue to have those conversations. In a certain sense, this is even still um, basically a first draft. This is uh, the, our, first, our first run at community indicators. Um, they may yet change as we go to actually reporting on them. Um, but hopefully they're the kind of thing that would uh, be useful and some good data for other folks. So just so you know, Rosie, we skipped down to uh, community indicators. Okay. Um, so, yeah, any comments or questions about the list as it stands? I had a couple. Yeah. I can't remember what they were. So. <laughs> um, I remember. Um, under environmental stewardship, a bunch of these um, I would suggest would be more useful if they were percentages rather than numbers Kay. because a lot of these things like um, vehicle miles traveled and um, number of single occupancy trips per week, if our population grows, which we are hoping that it will, those will go up and then we would have an indicator that showed that we were failing when actually we might be doing better. Um, That's a great call. So to, to reframe those in terms of percentages. That's excellent. Thank you. Do you uh, uh, Donna, then Connor. Sure. Do you actually have a color code indicator with this chart somewhere? Yeah, so, so I this. Can remember what they are. Yeah, so I have this in a Google spreadsheet um, that is <laughs> color coded. This is. <laughs> You're sort of seeing the like behind the curtain a little bit as to how I think and you know thinking in terms of color coding things. Um, so, but yes, that does live there. Sorry. So it's yeah. Okay. So on my link, I don't have it, but it's on the website. It's on the website. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Connor. So I, I think I mentioned it last time. I'm still not really down with including some of these school test scores. <laughs> so I think it sort of feeds into the notion of people teaching to the test. Yep. Which I don't consider an indicator of how well our students are doing here. That seems fair. So our teachers to be able to throw a frisbee to teach me, like physics, you know, if they uh, want to. It's just <laughs> all too apt. <laughs> oh, <Brown. laughs> I, don't, I don't know anybody who throws frisbees. Uh, okay, so um, are you suggesting like the SBAC scores or SATs? That yeah. uh, I'm happy to remove that. 
thoughts on that team? Um, one note uh, on that is that there is going to be this school report card um, from the AOE that may be. It. Yeah, well, it might include, but that might be sort of serving the same purpose without, uh, you know, getting at the yeah. socioeconomic um, sort of bias that's inherent there. Um, so. I'm not, um, yeah, I'm not sure that I agree with getting rid of that. I agree that it's it's a it's a partial and imperfect measure, but it is uh, something that people can look at and compare Montpelier to other uh, other places. Um, but uh, I, I guess I wouldn't sign on to just ditching it. Okay. I'll tell you, I don't have strong feelings about it. It's on there because I know the school keeps track, and and they publish that data, so it would be very easy to access. But so you know, one either way. What what's your pleasure, team? I'm with Connor on that. I if it's available elsewhere, that's then 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 that's fine. We can provide a link to it. But I I just feel like those numbers uh, they don't mean what everyone ascribes to them. Other thoughts on that? Go ahead, Donna. Well, just if you take that one, are you taking <coughs> all the ones that have a score or a grade associated with it? Because a lot of them do have some sort of a grade rating. Mm -hmm. Is it just one line you want to take out? I th or is it all the lines that refer to any kind of a score or school rating? No. That's back in the SAT? Just, the, just the SAT is the one you want to remove? And SBAC. SBAC. And SBAC, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Glenn? I'm not sure I have a strong opinion. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I'm leaning with Jack. If people are measuring it, we might as well include it. Um, what do you think, Rosie? Can, people can make up their own <laughs> minds. I, I don't feel strongly. I guess it depends on how we're presenting this. Are we, I mean, this is a data point that somebody can look at and ascribe whatever meaning they want to it, I guess. Um, if we are measuring our success based on that, then I guess it would be a different matter. You know, what we could do, potentially, team, is we could actually just take them both, well, uh, so the, the school is going to publish its own data. We could just have a link to the school, and that's their responsibility. What do you sure. think about that? Should we just, is that okay? Yeah, okay. All right, so well, let's just, uh, uh, we'll just have a link. Uh, to the to the school's uh, publishing of, of their whatever data they think is most relevant. So, um, so are you saying that for all the public well, school? Well, uh, um, I think actually to be fair, that would apply to anything that says Nancy Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> uh, those are all pieces of data that the school points to, and honestly, that's less that we need to maintain on an individual basis. So it would actually just be easier if we could say, "Interested in school data? Go here." Great. Yeah. So. Good plan. Does that, does that sound okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Any further comments? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, Laura Gephardt, Montpelier Development Corporation. I just would press pause because I sat in this awesome presentation earlier this week, I believe, for our Access Montpelier. And if, from what I'm hearing with these data points, you're trying to tell a story about each of these areas subject areas, correct? Or um, uh, goal areas? Yeah. They're our, under right. the big headings of goals, yeah. Yeah. Or so values or something. With this, with ArcGIS Hub, this provides you the capability to tell these stories and gather thousands of data points that allows you to compare to other communities, allows you to do you know, all these different things. So I would caution, don't keep it limited to just these data points. Um, maybe instead get to what, what are you trying to answer with these? Um, are you trying to inform the community, tell the story about how is our school system performing? That, that tool has that capability. Um, so rather than having these people try to give you numbers you know, every quarter or so, that might just be an easier solution and provides much more robust data um, and maybe gets closer to what you're trying to accomplish with these indicators. So one thought is that uh, 
so this is this is sort of draft one, and I think the plan would be to take these and see how we would be uh, how we would be plugging them into the in the Invisio software. And I think the um, the, the goal certainly is to um, to tell a story. Um, you know, ho hopefully have this inform. Um, you know the community about who we are, and you know I'm certainly interested in that. And so I uh, I, I see that as like a next phase, right? So um, supposing we approve these indicators, then um, really the next phase is to say, okay, so how do they either interface with um, Access Montpelier or Invisio or both? And I actually I'm going to guess that we may have a, yet another round of tweaking them. But this is just a you know. Are we ready I mean, to? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to explain my understanding, and you know, this is your initiative, so I don't want to. No, I don't want to mansplain. Yeah. Um, well, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the idea is, is we lay out some, some specific criteria for um, the community. These aren't necessarily things that the city does or doesn't do. Maybe the meals, and, and that it's just the kind of thing we can see statically year after year, like how how are our, how's our student health you know health risk assessments going how are our home sales going those kinds of things those are it's, it's not it's just stuff we would have and once a year maybe update and say you know and then so over a period of time we could we could draft that we i think there's it's, you know like you're saying there's a huge opportunity to bring other things in or integrate this in but i saw this as just something that's kind of it's in some ways intended to in, just be informative for us and then as the city council might look at it year in year out or after five years and say whoa, we're really slacking here, maybe we should then enact a program or bring up, you know, do something about it as opposed to, oh, this is just happening. Yeah. Does that help clarify? Totally. Okay. I just wanted to point out, because I sat down with David Healy and geeked out over this. <laughs> and right now with your current license, you have access to 3,000 some data points. So you can you have access to all these indicators. It's just <clears throat> pulling the, you know, pulling the report. So I just wanting you to think through what's the easiest process instead of having individuals kind of dole out these different data oh, points. Oh, I wouldn't, yeah. Um, and maybe, yeah, and maybe looking at what's all in that system and, I don't know. So just No, that's great. Um, uh, one of the, um, a, a potential modification to the recommended action could be, I mean, because the, the recommended action right now is just adopt community indicators. It could be adopt community indicators and direct city staff to, you know, explore, um, you know, best other. Best way to present them or something. Yeah, the best way to, to present them or um, compare them. So, uh, yes. Uh, Peter Kelman. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Hang on one sorry. second. This oh. is not working. Can you please oh. sit at the table? I apologize. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Peter Kelman. Uh, I, I, speaking for myself and for, in a way, for the uh, Social and Economic Justice Committee, I, I think it is important, and I'm, where I'm kind of at a handicap because I haven't seen the indicators, but it is important, I think, to look carefully at the indicators to be sure that there aren't any biases or biased uses that could be made of some of the indicators. So I think the point about that you can tell us a story, you can tell a bunch of different stories, and a bunch of different people can tell a bunch of different stories. I think Bill's idea that this is actually a document to help uh, you track and decide and discuss, that's great. You know, the dirty laundry, you know, I mean, the potentially dirty laundry is in, the, in here. But when you start to put out stuff that can lead other people to say, aha, you see, and tell the story that they want. So you gotta, gotta, I just think we need to be a little mindful of how this could be used. That's fair, and you know, certainly open to suggestions there, so. So is, is this available for others to see? Yeah, it's, it's online. Okay, I will take a look. Do you have more comments? I just want to make one comment. Yeah, please. Which is that I don't see anything on there. I'm Julia Schaefitz. I don't see anything on there tracking um, anything having to do with racial or ethnic makeup of the city. Um, I was thinking that. Yeah, and you know, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, 
I don't I don't know where the like where your what your sources of data are for for this or if that's been considered the census yet. Census could be. Sense, but um, the other thing that um, I've been hearing a little bit more about recently is um, both folks leaving the city um, because they people of color in particular leaving the city because they don't feel comfortable, um, or uh, folks visiting and not feeling comfortable, even relative to other Vermont towns. So. Um, I think that's something for the city to have an eye on. I'm going to, I think that's worth checking on. Like, I, I feel like we had that conversation. I'm not sure what's not on this list, but it, so. it, it, there's population by age group, race, gender, and disability. Okay. Um, oh, okay. I think we could, there are more data points that we could <laughs> put in there to capture what you're talking about. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Uh, Jack. When you mentioned, well, all the lines that include uh, that are saying talk to Nancy Fitzpatrick yep. for uh, yeah, one of those is down below and it's the uh, percentage of uh, children on free and reduced meals mm -hmm. which I think it's very important not to take that out of there I'm remembering a couple of years ago hearing Nancy or hearing Rebecca Holcomb speak and uh, and she said mm -hmm. Your prosperity is tied to the most vulnerable child in your community. So maybe we want to call that so, one out particularly. So keep that, yeah. Okay, we'll keep that one. Okay. Great. Note noted. Uh, Glenn. Uh, just one question about. Um, it looks to me like under public health and safety, uh, the newly added ones are sourced but the older ones are not sourced? Am I misreading that? I'm not sure why that is. I've, um, I'd have to get back to you on okay. as to not why. Worried. But that's Just a good question. Check in. Well. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> See, go ahead. I don't see anything under public health and safety about um, fires. Just number of fires. Am I just missing it? We do report that regularly. I think I'm just kind of missing it on there. So. Well, let's uh, let's put it on there. Okay. And again, this is that we can absolutely tweak it later on. That's perfectly fine. If there's any, I know people are people are reading, <laughs> reading through them. Those colored things are a little hard to see. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Is there any further? Yes? Please do. <laughs> it's good. Um, under public health and safety, I wonder about um, uh, police complaints or the complaints against police behavior or if there's any, like, if there's any way or civilian oversight of police in any way, like, to track that. Do, uh, is that something the fire, or I'm sorry, the uh, police department uh, keep I track of? So, yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you. I'm also wondering about um, children in state custody, if, if that's data. I'm pretty sure that that is available through DCF, mm -hmm. um, but that can be an indicator of community health as well. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, I don't know that I saw anything um, about substance abuse. There's, there's drug, right? Opioids aren't public health and safety, there's a couple. A measurement of drug use in Montpelier. Um, but we don't include alcohol in that, and I, I think... Drew, should we do that? I think that's important. I'm trying to find the line here. It's, uh, it's like halfway down. It's underneath hate crime data. <coughs> oh, measurement of drug use. Um, uh, drug and alcohol. Drug and alcohol, okay. And again, we'll just have to see. It, it may, you know, evolve as to like exactly what, you know, how we're reporting that. But but service providers in the area may have to report on that anyway. Yeah. Population served and yeah. Okay. All right, is, uh, Jack. I uh, include myself in this of having been bad at not really putting time into thinking about this. You know, the nature of this kind of discussion is that once you get into it, 
you can immediately think of five other things that aren't listed that uh, that should be, and so it might be useful to uh, like set herself uh, a date to review it again and uh, and come up with uh, with more suggestions, maybe with a tickler going out to the uh, council mm -hmm. in advance of that. Well, so since this is our second time reading through it, I mean, what, I guess what I would suggest is that we implement something and that we continue to to think about it and um, adjust it. Because you're right, we could uh, we could just talk about indicators for we find this forever. Yeah, forever, right? Like it could go on indefinitely. Uh, and you know, and over time, the things that we care about and things that we want to track might change, or they, they probably should change. Um, so my hope is that you know, while this list is probably imperfect, um, I would like to start. I, I would rather start collecting, or not necessarily collecting data, but um, start uh, saying, all right, this is what we're going to try to to do, and then adjust it. Um, but we should have a. I, I, what I'm hearing um, uh, from your comment is that maybe we should plan to review the indicators once a year, and it might actually make some sense to do that. You know, early with the new council um, to say these are the things that we have been tracking. Do you want to make adjustments, mm -hmm. um, Rosie? I think it would also be useful to um, send this out to the committees who deal with these areas mm -hmm. and say, you know, take a look. Do you have any suggestions for better indicators or other things that we're not covering? Mm -hmm. um, because we do have a bunch of committees that are really focused on all of these different issues. So. Yeah. I agree. Um, and I think it would make sense maybe even to, uh, because we're going to be inviting um, other committees in our uh, strategic plan, our yearly strategic planning session, um, that, could, that would be a great time to do that potentially. Um, just thinking out loud. Um, but in the meanwhile, I would love to, if there's a motion to adopt these and direct the city manager to adjust as needed. I'll uh, move to adopt the community indicators as amended tonight. Second. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Great. Thank you all. Um, looking forward to this data. Uh, and speaking of data, sorry? Yes, exactly. Speaking of data, we're going to go back to the uh, recreation feasibility study, which had a lot of data. That was great. How are you all doing, team? Do we need a break? Are you feeling good? Yes? I, yeah. We, it's a break would be good? We so, need to set up anyway. So fantastic. So we're going to take a five-minute break, and uh, you all can set up. We'll be back. So we'll introduce ourselves. Yes, welcome. And we're, we're coming back from our, our break. Please do. Please introduce yourselves. Yeah. Marty McMullen, Recreation Director. Sue Allen, Assistant City Manager. Ken Ballard, Ballard King and Associates. Chris Hancock, Citizen. Um, just, I'm going to turn this over to Ken and let him walk you through the, the various proposals and, and the survey. Um, I just want to remind you all that where this started was concern over the existing rec center, which is not ADA compliant. It uh, <coughs> needs work. There are code violations. So we're sort of starting from the assumption that doing nothing is not an option. Uh, that's kind of where we are placeholder. And it also adds a certain urgency to doing this work, because we can't let that center just hang out there forever. So with that as the background. I've also asked Ken to be short, but he has <laughs> tons of data to show you. So ask any question and it's in here. He can answer it. So Ken. Okay. Well, good evening, Mayor and members of Council. As Sue indicated, I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on this pretty quickly and show you kind of the back end of this. And again, if there's other information that you want to uh, see or, or work with, we can bring that up. But we're going to kind of make this short and sweet. Just a little bit about Ballard King & Associates. We've been around for almost 27 years. We're a recreation planning firm. Uh, we specialize in recreation center work. Uh, we've done you know, over 700 projects across uh, 49 states, have about 200 facilities, mostly public facilities open around the country. We've done over 25 projects in New England, kind of a list of some of the more uh, recent ones that we've done. So. Uh, this is what we do, and I've uh, been having a, a lot of fun uh, working on your project up to this point. Real quickly, the, the parameters of our study. This is an indoor community center, rec slash recreation center study. That's what we've been focusing on. Our tasks are 
market analysis, which is understanding the demographics not only of Montpelier, but also of a larger market area. Uh, understanding who is currently providing services, whether they're public, nonprofit, or for profit. Uh, doing community input, a series of focus groups. We've had a seven, or excuse me, 11 different focus groups over uh, two different occasions going back to October. Uh, community meetings, we just finished the second one here right before this meeting. And then a statistically valid survey that was done in November and December. So where we sit is the next one, which is the project options and what we're going to talk about here tonight. So the first two, the market and the community input, really kind of inform us on uh, where we think the project could go and we're going to share some options with you. Uh, once we get some direction, we'll be doing some operational impacts on the direction that uh, the project may go. Also explore a little bit more uh, on the partnership side. So what do we see coming out of this as kind of the issues for the project? Well, if the question is what to build, is it a new center? Is it rehabbing the existing Berry Street Recreation Center? It kind of is, Sue indicated, doing nothing really isn't an option for you. If you do build a new facility, where do you build it? Is it downtown? Is it on the edge of town? Or is it some other location that may be out of town? Who are the potential partners? And we've started to work on identifying potential partners for the project and where we are. Clearly, one of the biggest questions for any project of this nature is, how do you fund this from a capital perspective? And how do you operate it? What are the financial implications of both of those? And ultimately, what amenities do we need to include in the facility? And this is even going back to the rehabbing option that says, what do we get out of that? And what would be potentially in a new facility? And ultimately, how do we move forward and which way do we move forward? So these are some of the questions that we're going to focus on and uh, we're looking for your input on as well. Uh, clearly, as we present these kind of three options to you tonight, we want to understand what the right option is to meet the needs of this community, but also fitting within the financial realities that are always present in a project of this nature. And really, what does the center need to contain and what does it need to have to meet community needs? And this is community needs not only today, but looking out into the future. So let's talk about the three options that we've kind of put together for this project. And there's kind of two sub-options under the first one. These are not in any particular priority order or recommendation. This is just kind of laying it out there. The first one is just saying we're going to rehab the existing Berry Street Recreation Center. One of the options is to sit there and say, we're going to do the minimal amount of improvements, the code improvements, the ADA access issues, but that's really it. So you basically have an improved building, but it's what you have now. You're not getting any space out of it. Uh, it'll be, uh, you know, meet, meet the requirements, but you're not really getting anything more than what you currently have now. The second option is to take it further, do all of the things that are in the first piece there, but now also allow use of the basement area, which is not currently in use because of access issues and other, other things, as well as the second floor, which both have usable space potentially if they're remodeled. Obviously, that one we actually gain space and how that's utilized, how it's uh, used for recreation purposes uh, can be determined, but you're getting something more than what you have now. It's within the footprint of the building. We, we really don't have the ability with the site limitations to go outside of the existing structure of the building, but it's what we'd be doing inside of that. The second one is deciding, well, what we really need to do, and we can't fit it or really use uh, the existing recreation center, but we're going to build a new recreation center with the components and pieces that to people have identified as being important uh, for the facility, what we heard during the community input process. And then the last one is a combination of the first two, build a new center and keep the Berry Street Center. Uh, obviously, you'd have to do improvements to Berry Street, uh, and you'd also uh, be committed to build a new facility. So those are the three options. I'm going to kind of take you through these in, in a little bit more detail in terms of what we kind of basically see as basic pros and cons and some really preliminary uh, cost uh, information. So. Rehabbing the existing Berry Street Recreation Center. What are the pros? Well, it's a lower cost. You have a, a, an existing building that's there. Uh, yes, we have to do a lot to renovate that and bring it up to code and, and make uh, you know, improvements, but there is an existing building. 
it's in town. It's, 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 it's walkable. Uh, people told us in the community meetings, and it came out real high in the survey, that walkability was important. It certainly supports that. Because it's lower cost, it's a little easier to fund. We really see this as being a, a city of a Montpelier project in this regard that you would take on really the responsibility, much like you do now for that facility. Um, the cons really are not going to be able to add a lot of new amenities. Uh, again, we're kind of dictated by the site limitations and the building limitations. Things like a swimming pool really aren't possible at, at that site. And the reason I put that in here is the pool came out as the number one priority coming out of the survey in terms of what people wanted to see. Not unusual, that's always a pool, indoor pools almost always in the top three, uh, oftentimes the top number one or number two. But we're limited in, in really being able to do that with using the Berry Street Center. Other partnerships are also limited. There's a number of things you can do there. It's pretty limited, so it's hard to bring in any real what we call equity partners that are gonna put uh, potentially dollars into the project itself. And certainly the issue of lack of parking. Uh, you know, if we do the full uh, kind of renovation expansion of the center where we're getting that basement and that upper level to work uh, and provide new space, we'd expect the utilization rate for that facility to increase pretty dramatically. Well, when we do that, we're going to have more people coming. Do we have the ability to park them, to get them into the facility? Certainly the fact that we're in town and have the walkability issue helps with that. But, uh, you know, you're going to get a lot more use out of that. So that, that's another potential issue. Cost to do this, the minimal one, which is just code implications and everything else, could could be two to maybe three million dollars. And these are pretty, you know, just uh, very general cost estimates. We are not an architectural firm. We're not a capital cost estimating. This is a little bit out of our bailiwick. Uh, when we move further with along with this, we will try to nail this down a little more through utilizing some of the services of people that can do that. But anyway, there's gonna be a certain level of cost associated with that. The improved side of that could push that up to $5 million by getting, uh, again, those other two levels. So they're, they're not cheap. And again, anytime we're talking about a renovation of a building of that age, uh, there's so many unknowns, it, it's always a little bit of a uh, concern and you carry a huge contingency just because you don't know what you're dealing with, do you really get into doing it? So it, it, you know, that's kind of what it might be. Operational subsidy, when we say operation subsidy, that's the difference between costs of operation and revenue potential. It's the, what the net is, if you will, of what you're dealing with. Uh, your subsidy level could go up by nothing if we're just doing the simple um, improvements to the, um, to the building without adding space up at, upstairs and downstairs. May not have much of any, maybe pick it up a little bit, uh, potentially up to about $50,000 net increase in cost to the city. Do the full building improvement. Now we've got two extra floors. We're gonna have two uh, spaces that'll be utilized for a number of functions. We would expect to be bringing in revenue in some program areas for that, but you'll still have a net cost increase to that, and that could be a pretty wide range right now. I, I think it'll be more on the lower end of that scale, but that remains to be seen. What's the main driver of the improved, uh, increased, uh, well, we're gonna you're gonna have to heat and cool on a better basis those spaces uh, than what okay. you're doing now. Okay. We're gonna have to clean them. Mm -hmm. We're also gonna have programs and activities. We're gonna have to pay instructors for those programs. Have staff there to do that. So it, it's a kind of combination of all that stuff. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So new center. Uh, what are the pros on this? Well, it can be a full facility. We can, you know, we're not limited by site. In fact, we would say that whatever you do at a new center, that we have to be looking for a site that would allow this to be supported. So that potentially could have aquatics, whether it's done in the first phase or a late, later phase, and you would find a site where ultimately you could do a full build out even if it was in phases. So you can sit there and say the future of indoor recreation for the large part could be at this location. You potentially have more partners. Uh, you have more amenities. Uh, we also, as we'll talk about later, probably won't be downtown. So you may be able to bring more partners. And we say partners, we're really talking potentially equity partners, ones that are bringing dollars to the table. Because of the size and magnitude of the facility and adding aquatics, you're, you're really taking on kind of a regional focus now. Uh, before the Berry Street facility is primarily what it is now, 
it's going to be really inward focused on your residents. This becomes now uh, a much more regional facility by certainly the amenities it has and potentially even by where it's located. You would need to have improved access and parking. We'd have to find sites that would support that. Hopefully we'd still be able to get uh, uh, other forms of, of uh, access in terms of everything from walking to trail access to biking, all of that. Cons, obvious thing, we're talking about a much larger building, high cost to build, and you don't have an existing structure. You're probably starting from ground zero, so you're gonna have to take on the full cost of, of building that building. It's likely not downtown, and by downtown I mean in the city core, and it's because of the size of the building, uh, parking and other requirements, it, you know, finding that kind of property or purchasing property to do that, probably not likely. Wouldn't say it's impossible, but not likely. And the reality is, we get to cost here in a minute, you're going to need an equity partner, somebody else putting money into this project. Capital cost depends upon what you're doing, the size and magnitude, and a lot of it's driven by aquatics and whether you have that in the first phase and how big it is. And that could be anywhere from 12 to 20 plus million dollars. So it, it's a big price tag to do that. These are not cheap buildings to build. Um, operational subsidy, again, difference between expenses and revenues. The net cost, if you will, to whoever the operator is, anywhere from about $150,000 a year to maybe as high as $350,000 a year. So there is a subsidy involved with that, obviously. And then the third option, which now involves Again, keeping the Berry Street facility would have to have some level of improvement to it and building a new one as well. You get two facilities. Uh, obviously, you would have those in different areas serving different er uh, users. You would have potentially both a, a local focus and a regional draw. You'd be have multiple types of uses, maybe by different locations, uh, more opportunities in multiple locations. You, you just have more variety. This is the highest cost option on the con site. I mean, you're having to make improvements to your existing uh, facility and you're building a new one. Also has the highest operating cost because we're subdividing the market. Uh, so we're having some folks that are going to one location for certain things, one to another. Uh, some people will say, well, I don't need to go to that location because I can do that here. Uh, so it kind of divides up your market. That contributes to higher operating costs by two facilities and minimizes a little bit some of the revenue potential that's there. Cost implications, this one's a little harder because you're dealing with two of these things, but it's basically anywhere from 14 to 25 plus million dollars. And the subsidy now is about that 300,000 to $500,000 range. So that's kind of real quickly, if you will, the options. Um, we're certainly interested in, in your input, your questions on which of these you would like to see us pursue. Um, it may be some version that we don't have up there, but. That's kind of where we sit. We kind of want some idea of how important you think different elements may be to occur in, uh, to have in this facility. And we, uh, again, you know, we can talk a bit about some of the project partnering aspects and those types of things as well. So that's kind of the long and short of it. Again, I, I'm prepared to talk about survey results if you need to and, and other things as well. I have slides on those if you Yeah, we sent the survey out on Friday, so maybe you've looked at it and don't need that. But Ken is prepared to talk about the survey results if anybody would like more interest. He's also been talking to sort of equity partners in the region uh, to get to gauge some interest of sort of the business community to partnering with us on something like this. Can you elaborate on what you mean by equity partners? Are these investors or are these... Um, <coughs> businesses that would be providing services or somehow like doing something more than just paying it, it, for it? it? It could be all of the above. It's uh, But equity says they're actually putting dollars into the project, either capital and or operational dollars into that. Their involved, level of involvement would depend on the partner. Uh, some of them may want to simply say, for the public good, we're interested in doing that. And, and doing, others may say, we actually want to have some type of a presence in the building. Can you give me a, are you talking like large employers or are you talking like a, an exercise uh, company that wants to use the space? I, I'm just Could having be, a hard I would time say understanding it's a higher level here. than that. It's, it's uh, some major businesses that may be willing to help uh, fund the capital construction of the building. Some of the partners we've talked about um, that are a little more aligned with some of the purpose of the facility might actually want to go beyond just giving potentially dollars for the facility, but actually have a presence, and they would be a medical provider. Okay. 
Yes. The Berry Street existing facility is in the designated TIF district, right? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, it is. And, um, okay. So, in theory, that could be a public private partnership. I know the city owns the building right now, right? But if, for example, we were to find an equity partner who was willing to put up a significant amount of money, the city would, could in some way partner with them. Is that permitted with a TIF district? Or, or if the city sold the building to someone with a, a, an agreement that this is going to be used for this purpose? I think it would be more that there was a, this would have to be an improvement that was related to a private investment. So let's say, theoretically, someone next door was putting in a health facility and this was going to be a public improvement next door. We might be able to use the TIF funds from that to help pay for this, but I'm not sure. We'd have to look at that. I don't know how on point that would be for TIF. We'd have to see. But so if like a nonprofit bought the space and then... Well, uh, we'd have to, yeah, I'd have to see what the link would be. What, what, what this was doing that was allowing the business to, to go we, in. We've used TIF funding in other states for public uh, centers. I don't know that, that there may be limitations we can do in Vermont. But it's pretty strict in Vermont, Vermont, what we can I think that, that might be something that's worth... We'll oh, look yeah. into that for you, yeah. Ashley. I, I think the other issue is, I, I, to be honest with you, we've kind of noted, I think we're going to have big problems getting a equity partner actively involved in Berry Street because I just don't know that there's enough there for a real partner to get much out of that unless they were going to take it and use it for some other different purpose. But to actually, on the same level as saying we're going to partner to develop a, a, or improve for a community purpose, I'm not sure you're going to get, there's going to be much traction with that. Um, and then the other thing is, do we have, are there any like sites specifically that were looked at? I know we had talked last time about the, the possibility of holding open an option for the red zone, but I don't think that made it anywhere with the legislature. Um, We've floated site ideas. Redstone is now, uh, assuming the papers have been signed privately owned, that property is privately owned, and that would be a great location for it if that private owner would be willing to talk to us about it. Uh, we've looked at, I mean, I'm sort of dreaming here, so when people see it on TV, they don't need to panic, but National Life has some, some land. You come right off the interstate and head up to National Life, that might have some regional interest, or up by the hospital, or um, in town, maybe down even uh, by the Elm Street rec field with the pool, that you know, the outdoor pool there. So we're sort of keeping everything on the table, uh, you know, even talking about Sabin's Pasture or some land owned by the Vermont um, College of the Fine Arts. We're probably looking for a site realistically that's, on the grander vision, at least where we sit right now, may need to be as large as five acres. And, that's, that's a, and that would be to support not only the building, but also required parking and that type of thing. So it's not a small site. Now, there are ways to stack these things and others, but it's going to be hard to do it. You might, big might, be able to do it on three acres. I've never really seen it done on less than that. One of the survey results that's probably worth mentioning is um, while people do want a pool and might want a new facility, we asked them if they're willing to pay for that what, through their taxes, and there was a little bit less enthusiasm when you asked that question. Um, more than half seem to be either very willing or somewhat willing to renovate the uh, existing facility. I was, I was going to ask Ken increase. what his take, you know, we, we all have our own local biases yeah. and preferences here, but you're, you're the out-of-towner. Um, what, what was your read of the survey results, in, in, if there's a quick... I, I actually was concerned that it would be far more negative than what it was. I was actually somewhat feeling a little bit better about this. I think there's reasonable, you know, here's the question on basically improving Berry Street, and actually, that, that's reasonably strong. Uh, you know, you have a, in both of these, you have huge numbers of maybe and not sure, and that's not unusual in a survey of this nature because people go, I, I don't know. There's a whole lot of other questions, you know, right. that they need to, to answer. But that shows a willingness to at least look at that. You have a yes of 41, 
you know, you even take half of those next two in the maybes and the not sures, you're there. And the no's are, are about almost a little more than half of the, of the yeses. So I, I'm encouraged by that one. That's, you know, that has a, a possibility of, of moving forward. And again, the key thing is getting those people that are in that unsure right, maybe sure. information that they ultimately need to make a decision. And, and so that, and compared to other projects, that's not too bad. This one, and it, you know, part of it's the magnitude, is I would say it's not a non-starter, but it's certainly a much higher mountain to climb. You know, yes here is, is only 25%. And um, you know the maybes and not sure. And now because we're talking bigger dollar amounts, are huge numbers. I mean, we have over 40 percent in that category of uh, I don't know. And now the no number's gone up. So um, I, I wouldn't say well, just forget it. But it's definitely going to take some work. The first one's a lot more palatable to the community than this one is. And. You know, this is the one, you know, it says, well, tell me what I'm getting. Tell me who else is participating in this, uh, what we can go. I think the other key thing that's in here, the, the 200 to 350 number does not get you to the full dollar amount to pay for the full center. You, you, that's, that's not funding all of it. That's funding maybe 50%. So that's where we talk about the equity partner. You know, this is going to be hard enough. This is going to get you maybe half, a little more than half of what you would need potentially. That's with the pool. You take the pool out of the equation, you're, you're higher. But even then, I don't think you're going to fund it all from a, a tax number. So you're going to need other sources. And that's where we talk about the equity partner piece being pretty critical if you're going to move forward with this concept on, what, on the bigger standalone facility. One of the things that I've been wondering about for as long as this conversation is going on is that it's privately owned but we have a facility just a few miles up the road where there's a pool there's indoor tennis there's a lot of uh, recreational yep. uh, opportunities and I wonder um, why is that uh, what how, how do we keep compete with that or how does it how will it make sense to to do this when, when First and Fitness is already up there? Um, well, part of our market analysis was to understand who's there in, in the marketplace. Um, a facility of this nature is very different from a private facility in terms of you know, what you do there, the types of programming, the way you gain access, and everything else. Um, it also doesn't perform financially like a private facility, and that's where we're showing an operational loss in those options. And part of it is, is, is trying to get access so that people don't have to be members of a facility to utilize this. Um, you know, I'm from out of town, but if that facility was there tonight, I could go plunk down my dollars for a pass for tonight, go in there, utilize it, I'm done. Uh, certainly passes and, and our memberships would be available, but there's a lot of different ways to access the facility. So it's, it's a different thing. You know, a lot of people say, well, I already belong to this facility. And what we say is, that's awesome. And what is is, you know, there'd be other things you may want to do at our facility. Come on down. Take that class. Take that program. Do something in our facility that, that is not available. Or maybe somebody else in your household uh, wants to be doing as well. And that's the beauty. You can kind of come and go as you want. But that also, because of that, limits our ability to cash flow the operation of the facility. So there, it's a different animal than the, the public, excuse me, than the private sector in terms of what, what typically is available and how it's utilized by the general public. Kim, I was really curious about this chart and yeah. another one. Here, it's like you give them two chances to say maybe and not sure. Yep. I mean, that's like, that's another opportunity to say, to say no. So why did you have those two that are so similar in my mind? Um, well, the survey company, when we put this together, they don't ever like to have just a, a yes, no, and a not sure. They, they want kind of, it's more on how it scales it between that so, yes and no. So how do they define those two? Um, well, maybe basically says, you know, that's closer to yes that says, okay, really? yeah, I, I like that a little okay. bit better. Unsure is closer to no, going, I, I really don't know. So the way you see it set up there, you know, 
coming down from in terms of level of support, yes, maybe, unsure, no. Well, and likewise on on, the, on this other one, you have high priority, yeah. very high priority. Yeah. And to me, I combine those two and say, okay, there's 36 percent who's more than medium priority. Yep. So and that really just, is. I mean, part of the thing that was interesting out of this is that. Uh, you know, well, way over 50% thought this was a, at least a medium priority. And, yeah. You know, and, and again, and a very pretty low percentage, 28 thought it was a low priority. So it is on people's minds in terms of, yeah, you know, we have an interest in this, how that translates. And then we, we do some projects where that comes back as a, eh, I don't really think that's something you need to worry about. It's time to go, look, that's not really seen as a priority. I would say this is worth consideration by the city and by council to, in terms of what you may want to do. It, it's on people's not minds enough with that to, to, to do that. But again, I think part of that medium and even high number is once again the uncertainty of what are we talking about here? It says, you know, it keeps people from making that either high or very low. There's, you know, you get more information that will flesh out some of that middle ground a little bit more. One of the, I mean, property taxes would go up to, to fund this for sure, uh -huh. but one of the things um, that strikes me is there's a huge number of large employers, well, not a huge number, but there are a number of large employers um, who partner sometimes. I know with, I think, First and Fitness as a state employee, I, I have a, a, I get a member discount. Sometimes health insurance will pay for that. Um, did anything sort of look at, at that in this part of the study, or is that the next phase? We have had discussions with some of the larger employers in the area to gauge levels of interest in this. Um, you know, certainly at this point we don't have any commitments, but we have several that have indicated this is a project they're willing to look at. There are ones that they're, a project they're willing potentially to even help with some level of funding yet to be defined. Um, so, you know, I, we don't have anybody that's ready to sign the dotted line. We certainly haven't done an exhaustive study on that. But I think one of the things we were hoping is that if this was an option that the council wanted to pursue, there is a level of interest out there and that, uh, you know, you'd be able to leverage out some of the bigger employers that be able to sit there and say, look, we're not going to make up the difference, but we're involved in that. You can leverage that to get other other levels of funding from other sources as well. And there's at least some indication that that's worth pursuing. And in terms of, um, I'm just thinking about how Kellogg Hubbard goes to other area communities for funding as well. Would we be interested or would the city, is there any appetite or was that explored at all in this? Is, is going to other municipalities and for, you know, for, for we did think if we were going to build a new facility, it was going to have a regional focus. We should go to our other community partners and ask for some money. That's not big money. That turns mm -hmm. out not to be big money, right. but we would ask them for And I think you play. continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and there's implications. Uh, if, you know, if other communities don't want to partner, the price points of what they may have to do to gain access versus a resident of the community, they pay an upcharge potentially on that. So, there are some opportunities. We, we have had some initial discussions, haven't exactly been, uh, see them as, as viable equity partners at this point, but I don't know that that's absolutely definitive. And as this gets more defined, that, that needs to come back around again. So uh, something that I thought was really interesting in the survey was the um, number of people who currently use the rec center facilities generally in classes, and I think that was around 20, 22 yep. percent. And I found that surprisingly low for the amount of emphasis that we put on it. Um, and that kind of made me take a step back and think, okay, so this is this big community service that we're providing, but a, lot, a large share of our community is not utilizing it. And so what does that mean for how we prioritize this in the budget. And so, you know, one takeaway might be that we need to do stuff to expand how desirable these services are. One takeaway might be that this isn't something that our population is really interested in using, and so maybe we should scale back our, our efforts in this area. Um, so I, I'm curious what, 
how that participation rate compared to other communities that you've surveyed and what you might take away from that. Here's my take on this. Your, your rate of participation is low. It's actually a higher number than I maybe would have thought. To be honest with you, there, Berry Street Recreation Center, there's not much there. Well, and I kind of, scope. when I read that question, it, and it, had I answered that question, I would have assumed that, that you were asking about all of the rec department programming, not no, just, yeah. and, and that's, I, I would imagine that a bunch of people answered it that way. Um, and there is a lot of rec department programming outside of the current rec center. Oh, yeah. I, the intent was to gain who had actually used the Barry Street Recreation Center, not just recreation in general. But, I, you know, I would contend that you're limited in what you can offer in terms of um, general recreation programs on an indoor variety simply because of the limits of that. I think the interest in the survey says there's interest there. It's... You, you can't be met. I, even there was the other questions about, does this service your needs? And the response on those were very low. And that was just not this facility. That was very low compared to a lot of other locations. So I, I think there's a lot of, for lack of a better term, pent up demand. It's just that facility is not doing it. So I, I, I would say exactly the opposite. I don't think it's a question of whether you should in, invest more in that because not so many people are using it. I think the fact that you can only reach a pretty small percentage by, because of the uh, shortcomings of your facility is, is, is the issue. I have a thought to add yeah. to your question. Um, some people don't use it because it doesn't have a pool, it doesn't have exercise machines, et cetera. Um, but a lot of people are trying to use it even for what it does have. Um, I'm a regular user. <clears throat> the last time I went to play basketball, we had 20 people show up at lunchtime. We had to cycle through. You could only play half the time. Um, there's tremendous competition for hours. And so this time of year, that building is just uh, used almost every hour of the week. Um, and so the pickleballers are frustrated that they can only get the hours that they can get. Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, <clears throat> middle school age kids doing having basketball practices. Um, uh, so it's kind of maxed out is another factor. And to Rosie's point, I, I wonder, though, if that's, I mean, that's obviously reflective of the people that are here now, and part of what Montpelier is trying to do is to grow and to attract m new residents. And so I'm sure that there's probably research out there about this already. But in terms of, like, you know, we're looking to grow the grand list, so we're, you know, investing in housing and all of those other things. Would would one of these particular models be more desirable or less desirable to populations that we're trying to bring in? Interesting you should say that. You know, right before this, we had a, a community meeting, and it wasn't particularly well attended, but we had some pretty uh, frank discussions, and some of it were with um, what I would say or younger uh, people in their 20s, early 30s, and they made it pretty clear that they thought, you know, something that was more would, you know, they're saying, look, if, if, if Montpelier wants to try to, to attract people here and, and get a younger dynamic in place, you need these kind of facility and beyond just Berry Street. They said that, that, that is not enough. So th their whole premise was, and even to keep them here, it says, you know, we need more if you're trying to attract this younger population. So it kind of anecdotally got, got to your question there. Just to, to follow that up, though, they also expressed some concern about raising they the did. property taxes mm -hmm. that it's, you know, they would like to buy houses in Montpelier. So at the same time, they were very anxious for us to pursue partners to try to hold the cost of the facility down. And some of the businesses actually said that this would help them attract employer, employees to the area. They felt like that would be a, a draw. So I think ultimately what we're looking from, from council is a little bit of direction on how you want us to proceed. We're kind of at this little more than 50%, maybe in the two-thirds range. So how do we deliver back to you something that meets your needs and expectations? I don't have, we don't have to have an answer to that tonight, but at some point we want to have at least a blessing that we're heading in the right direction. What do you want to see us do? If you're saying, don't look at this option, we don't want to go there, that's fine. We just kind of want to have a little bit of insight. 
Uh, Connor, you had a hand raised. Do you? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what does fitness mean to you? In this? Fitness is anything from group exercise classes to you know functional fitness to machine weights to cardio. It's a broad term that covers a lot of that, without having to break it out into all the particulars. But it's 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 a you know active fitness-based program. Do you see like uh, possibly a slice this up even more? Like they got the fl Planet Fitness there, right? It's like 80 machines there. Right. You pay, what, 10 mm -hmm. bucks a month. Mm -hmm. Seems like a pretty good business model, right? Yep. I don't know if like the fitness equipment necessarily needs to be in this place. I look at Vermont College of Fine Art. They got a ton of space back there. Could you do a fitness center up there and a pool somewhere else maybe? Could it be phased out? You, you can. One of the things is we talked about just to keep in mind, we talked about doing well, if you do Barry Street and you do a new records, the more we spread these pieces out, the less cost effective it is for whoever's operating it. So if, if, the, if the city's wanting to do that, your cost to be able to do that, both from a capital and an operational, will go up pretty dramatically. Your revenue potential is generally less because now people are having to go multiple locations. The model of trying to get as much into one area is, is is kind of the most cost-effective way in a lot of larger cities we've been trying to consolidate uh, uh, facilities because they're not sustainable operationally or even capital-wise. So I just caution you that, that that's a difficult model to, to sustain over time. Just one more point I think we should all be thinking about. Like, it was 18 year, years old plus who was surveyed on this. Yeah, and, and we, I, have, we have it... Um, broken down by uh, the age of the respondents. We also have the ability to look at data uh, in terms of, so what did this age group, uh, were their responses different than some, you know, so you wanna look at, well, what do younger people say? What do older people say? If you look at the full survey document, there's like 200 pages back behind this stuff, and it's just the raw data, so you can look in there by age, by income levels, all sorts of different criteria, and you can kind of cut the data or see if there's anything that's different about that. Right. I think the one point I just want to make is, you know, even though a lot of people are okay with getting there by car, you know, there's probably a lot of kids who walkability is a huge factor. Yep. And that might not be taken into consideration here. Your walkability answer, I mean, we kept hearing that, but the response level, even out of the survey, was, that was high, way high. So, um, I know, Rosie, you have a comment, and then I would love to uh, just go around and if, if anybody has strong feelings about uh, what you are interested in what you want to support or don't want to support um, moving forward. I mean, we're not, this is not binding obviously at this point, so you know, general impressions are good, but um, yeah, and then we can be moving on. Yeah. So, the one comment I wanted to make is that um, I, thinking about our current rec department programming and what, how we might pay for this in the future, if we use public money to create this thing, then I feel pretty strongly that the bar to, to, entry and participation needs to be really low. And one of my <clears throat> concerns right now is that we have a lot of city money that goes to subsidizing you know, our, our rec classes and stuff, and then there's still a fee to, to use the classes. And I think that that means that the lowest income members of our community can't actually enjoy the amenities that we as a community are paying for, including the lowest income members of the community. And so it's very counterintuitive because I kind of, I also feel like, well, user fees, you know, if you're gonna use the amenity, then you should pay for it. Um, but I wanna be really careful that we don't try and split it down the middle too much and really support this with a lot of taxpayer money and then make the bar to entry high, so high that, you know, through an annual fee or, a, you know, a monthly fee that half our community can't use it because it's too expensive. So that's just a, I don't have an answer to that. It's just a challenge that I think we have with these sorts of programs um, and with this type of project. And I just want the council to be aware of it and thinking about maybe we take an, an all or nothing approach where either it's, you know, entirely city funded and we have no entry fees for residents or maybe it's not really funded by the city and we figure out some kind of method for us to facilitate this but that the city's really not putting any money in and it's fully user funded um so that's just a, a thought about that uh, done um, arnie i thought there was a sliding scale on the f course fees no we we do uh, um help when people are in a, a situation as far as classes go i'm not sure if people who have been turned away 
for classes or haven't my, come because my they can't afford it? My concern is that we don't, I know that you help out when people ask, but it's not one of those okay. things where we apply it across the board and make it really yep. obvious yep. that, you know, for people below this income level, this is how we handle it or, or anything like that. And I, it's another one of those things where, you know, we have this, if you're in the know, you can access it. If you're not, if you're from the outside, you don't know to ask. Um, and so I would like us to be a little bit more transparent about that. That's, that's a good point. I also feel, um, this, this is like my own little uh, pet thing, I suppose, but like I feel very strongly that uh, learning how to swim ought to be free um, because everyone ought to know how to swim. Um, anyway, but, that, but if you're going to take an ultimate camp, you know, for example, they should charge a lot for that. <laughs> you know, like, do you know what I mean? Like, everyone doesn't need to know how to play it's ultimate. But the instructor fees are so high. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I know. One Sorry to we look at now is it's not unusual to kind of tier programs and services so it gets at what you talk about that says swimming lessons are a basic service so those are going to be priced at a different differential than your like even private swimming lessons is it okay that's a different level or some of these other boring things so you have pricing scales that will adjust down there uh, and the more you can get programs spread between those things the better your cost recovery is I mean just to put it in perspective a facility that we're talking about on a new center with a pool just for the sake of conversation and you know your operating costs will be north of a million and a half dollars a year so if you're not bringing in a pretty hefty amount of income to offset that it becomes a non-workable issue so the issue is how do we make or have the people that have the ability to pay to pay and how do we handle those that are under that bar that cannot and a lot of facilities in some really socially and economically depressed areas have been able to work out systems that allow that to occur. Salvation Army and their Croc centers do that a lot. And so they're in the communities that are very difficult, the one in Boston and everything else that says, okay, we're, we're trying to make sure those that have the ability do, those that don't are taken care of. And we have those all those people in the same facility with not even really knowing that says, you didn't pay anything and I paid this much on it. So that, there's workable systems out there that still get the numbers that you need for revenue. There's a lot of different options for how people utilize the facility that will really just push up the amount of people that are coming through there. And you can make decisions, you may say, we're gonna have swimming lessons for all second graders in the city that are free. Those types of things are done and, and those are fine. And you know, uh, Arnie can sit there and tell you what the implications are of doing certain those things. I just need to be told that revenue is not a factor. <laughs> you know, a lot of <laughs> no, we make the school pay for it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So uh, impressions uh, from the council team for the direction for, for this crew. Go ahead. So I was really charmed by the Berry Street building when we took the tour this year. Um, I think having seen it back to back with the senior center and the amazing renovation in the senior center, I can really see the potential for that building being a beautiful space. And to me, I think that that's, you know, we have an opportunity with this historic building that's in a great location for a cost that isn't as big a hit to the city budget um, to make that space more usable. And so I'm, that, that's intriguing to me. I still have budget concerns and I wanna, you know, make sure that we're not continuously um, having an unsustainable tax rate, um, but, I could see some real big advantages to the city in that uh, with, with renovating the existing space. Um, I'm really, really wary of taking on the commitment of a city-run aquatic center, um, you know, knowing the capacity of our, our city staff and um, knowing the capacity of our city for, for a tax base. So, and I also, I'm, I can't think of a, it's really important to me that it be a walkable location, even if it is an aquatic center. And I can't think of a good location within the city to, to have that happen. And I feel like if we have another car-based pool outside of the city, how is that better than First and Fitness from a, you know, a, an accessible point of view for, for elderly folks in the city who are trying to be able to stay fit um, and not wanting to drive and from a, you know, it just, from an environmental perspective, there just seem like so many disadvantages to putting some kind of destination outside of the walkable core. So those are kind of where I'm at right now. Uh, Donna. 
Well, from the other end, I did not fall in love with the tour. I hadn't been in the building for a long time, and I just felt sad for it, that it just really needs help. But I am sold by the numbers that people are really looking for exercise, and there's a lot of small rooms there, as well as the basement. With true renovation, it can create a lot of niches for different things. So I'm much more into not just the rehab, but the improvements. Uh, that's much more sellable financially and use-wise, and it is in the core of walkability. Other thoughts? I'd agree with Donna. Jack. I, I know a big driver of this uh, discussion are a group of people who really, really want a pool. And uh, they are uh, very committed to wanting that. But I think that it's it's hard to, uh, as, as Rosie said, <coughs> see, we agree on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> as Rosie said, it's it's hard to see the, uh, the, the capacity and the willingness of uh, voters of Montpelier to, uh, to do something that big. Um, it, it would take a lot to, to convince me of that. Um, I, I see Rosie and uh, Donna talking about the, uh, saying kind of the same thing uh, about the rec, current rec center in different ways, which is that there's, there's real potential there. And, uh, and I, w I would like to continue to look at, look at expanding that uh, to see what we could generate. Any further thoughts? If not, that's fine. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, and maybe it's because I'm naive, although I don't know that I've been called that in probably <laughs> 33 years. Um, I'm curious about this, the, the TIF options and, and what may exist there. Um, and uh, additionally, I'm wondering, you know, assuming the responsibility of an aquatic center um, is, is something just based on finances alone that I don't think I could in good conscience vote for. Um, however, I'm wondering if there may be ways that we can make something like that happen, whether it's a, a partnership with, you know, First in <clears throat> Fitness that is an actual partnership which would, you know, really translate meaningfully to residents in Montpelier having access to a facility that already exists. Um, uh, or finding ways to, you know, really actually partner with surrounding communities to sort of go in all together in some way for a, a regional um, facility that everyone could could use. I, I know um, how many people approached me about the pool idea, and I love it. I think it's great. I would swim all the time. But that, that sort of taxpayer burden that would translate into a significant increase in rent uh, in Montpelier, um, it is just not sustainable to me. So, okay. And if you don't need to wait, if you don't want I've to. I've got to give more time to process. Okay. Have Fair. some ideas. I'm not sure if they're good. Sure. <laughs> Fair. Uh, uh, does that provide a mm -hmm. sufficient amount of direction for the time being? And I know you all are going to go um, do further work on this and are coming back at some point to yep. um, take up this conversation again. Can you fit a new facility on top of a parking garage? <laughs> <laughs> you, you laugh, but uh, we're getting ready to do one in, in South Florida. It'll be on the there top of a parking garage. Yeah, there you there go. We go. Yeah. Uh, Ken, can we have your slide presentation tonight given to us? I think you do. I uh, didn't. I, don't know. Know. I didn't get I it. We just changed, so but we can. And it's not on the website. Oh, it was the report. I'm sorry, it wasn't the, the slides. It was so the I think what we'll do if, you, if this sounds right is bring you bring you all a sort of flushed out renovation proposal perhaps for the Barry facility and maybe sort of keep a little conversation going on the side with partners for a, a you know larger aquatic facility if that should come through great Does that sound at least for me that was renovation and improvement and he improvement. actually yeah. he actually yeah. gave two little options the survey there. Okay. showed what people were looking for yep. and a lot of that can be done in the Barry that's great yeah I think thank that, you. yeah I agree okay. thanks it's thank great. you thank you very much thank you very okay much. All right, so um, on to the discussion of a public message board. Now, this is an item that um, Councilor Kruger had brought up uh, at some point. Do you, do you want to?
frame this? Sure. Um, so I've thought generally about how we as a council um, are limited in our communications by public meeting law and also how all our committees are limited in communication um, by public meeting law in that you can't have those sort of back and forth email discussions, you know, hey, here's this article I saw, what do you think about that? You know, and, and oh, this reminds me of something else. All of those discussions, um, if they're kind of relating to substance, really can't happen outside of a physical public meeting. Um, and that's state law. Um, and I've seen, um, you know, being on some of the, uh, the various committee um, email lists and stuff, I've seen people struggle with that and have to be reminded that, hey, you can't just reply all and um, give your opinion on this because it's not a public meeting. Um, so I, I think that if there were some kind of electronic forum where people could have those discussions and it would be readily viewable by the public, um, and, you know, and that would still meet the intent of the public meeting law, um, although it currently doesn't meet the letter of the law, I think that that could really help move discussions along and um, you know, make, make involvement in public discourse more accessible to people who can't necessarily afford to uh, in, attend a, a four hour meeting in person um, and can't necessarily afford to sit and watch our four hour meeting, you know, even though it's recorded and available online. Um, that's still a major time commitment to, to see what we're talking about. Um, so I think that this is a tool. It certainly wouldn't replace our current meetings and replace our current committee meetings, but it's a tool to make uh, those more productive. And so I would like us to ask our legislators to consider making some sort of amendment to Vermont public meeting law to allow for uh, communities to have electronic message boards that are used by members of their governing bodies and their um, committees uh, to have some of these discussions um, outside of a, a public forum. So I've done a little bit of, uh, not a lot, but a little bit of thinking around this and um, I, uh, I, so the, the question for me comes down to uh, the uh, the logistics, right, and making it accessible, because I think we all want p it to be, um, you know, accessible even to people who don't have electronic uh, capacities. And so um, just as a first step towards that, one of the things I could picture potentially is, um, like, let's say it's just a, a threaded discussion within a committee. Um, you know, they want to have a discussion around, uh, you know, some topic that seems relevant. If it were... Um, some kind of, we, we, what if we could call it like a supplemental conversation and that it could be approved uh, along with the minutes of the meeting um, so that it's, you know, accessible, as accessible as the minutes of any prior meeting, um, then um, that, that would be uh, one first step uh, towards that. Uh, and I, I think having, uh, you know, some thinking through like, okay, so how, how do people, you know, not, uh, you know, connected to electronics or not preferring to interact that way, is it still, is it still equitable and is it still accessible? Um, and that, that's one possibility, uh, just putting it out there. Other thoughts? <laughs> I just had a simple logistic question in terms of if we we're going to do this. Do you envision this or does the council envision this as being for the bodies only or would there also be public comment? And I'm sure I'll, I'll be asked that. So would it be, you know, in between meetings, the council's working over something and Julia wants to weigh in on it, can she do that? Or is that only, no, this is a chance to read this, but we still have the public comment here. So I guess I was envisioning some sort of, um, it's a back and forth between the members of the body, but there is some kind of public comment section um, where members of the public could generally address the committee through an electronic forum um, and have that be public if they wished. Um, so what you're envisioning is like a whole new platform, right, that you'd, you would have to go t to... So I'm envisioning that we ask the legislature to allow us to, if we can show that whatever electronic forum we're able to produce, and it might be different for Montpelier than it is for another community, um, but if we can show that this is, you know, 
the public can participate and see and you know be involved um, that they would allow that mm -hmm. um, and then what we actually do with that authority after we get it you know we can figure out you know what platform do we use and how does it work and all the logistics mm -hmm. around that and maybe I know Donna is very concerned about this maybe you have a group like us that decides you know Donna doesn't really like participating in, in this sort of written back and forth, and she would rather discuss in person. And so maybe as a group we decide, well, we're not really going to use that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe if we're a small subcommittee working group, and I ran into this, you know, when we have subcommittees of three people, you can't have any discussions outside mm -hmm. of your meetings at all. You can't even explain to somebody, you know, what's, what's going on or what your thinking is or what your next steps are outside because mm -hmm. two of the three of you make a majority and so you know it, it just it's very impractical <laughs> um so maybe we end up you know using it for those situations and not for whole whole um public disc or uh, council discussions i just want the authority from the legislature to do this so maybe it could be even the kind of thing where uh, if, the, if the whole group doesn't uh, agree then you just don't do it maybe yeah yeah uh connor i just wondering would it be worth uh Having Secretary Condos come in and just have kind of a round table with us. He's a, he's a very engaged constituent. He's a very engaged <laughs> sometimes, but uh, I bet he'd be happy to come down and just kind of throw some ideas out. Because the other thing is if we rank the legislature and the SOS uh, opposes it, I don't like our odds anyways. So I'd almost rather start working kind of collaboratively with them to come up with something. Just, just yeah, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I saw Rosie and then Donna. Yeah. I'm, 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 Ashley. Ashley. I just called you Rosie. Uh, the other thing I'm wondering about is just getting an advisory opinion from the Secretary of State about the feasibility, in, just in terms of, like, is that something that could be permitted with some reading of public meeting law? Um, and, then, and then that might give us some insight in terms of how we could shape or structure a conversation going forward. There you go. Oh, go down. I, I thought Bill sent us an email about this Maybe I read it somewhere else. I just like a picture. I don't know how you can have a conversation over here that involves a few people from this body and a few of the public, and then meanwhile you have this meeting that's official and you have this discussion over here. So do we sit and have to read all of this to know what's gonna happen here? And how does it not become a front porch forum where a small group just takes on this topic and gets it way out left field? So those are my concerns. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jack. I, I think it's an intriguing idea uh, because we all know that there's, for most issues of, that we discuss here, we don't get a lot of public input at our, at our meetings. But I also kind of worry if, uh, if there's as full a discussion as one could imagine on this message board well, people show up at the meeting and their reaction was going to be, well, I wanted to tell them what I th thought, but the decision was already made mm -hmm. because they've been talking about this for three weeks on, uh, on their computers. And so those are fair criticisms. I, you know, I think that those are all things that we need to figure out um, so in I implementation. Say, but so I'm saying explore it. I'm not saying no, but there are some concerns. Uh, what do we, I'm trying to think of like next steps here, team. Um, so where do we want to go with this? I would be happy to make a motion that we direct city staff to um, reach out for an advisory opinion to the Secretary of State's office about uh, the current state of the law and, and what nuance may exist there to allow for something like this. I second that. That's, uh, that's okay. All right. Uh, all right. Further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So before we go off that topic, um, I don't I don't know if that has to be the end of it because I suspect that either they'll take longer than, they, than we want them to to give us an advisory opinion, or more likely they'll quite very quickly say. Yeah, this isn't allowed under current law. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think Connor's suggestion of inviting Jim Condos to come in and just be part of a discussion while that's going on might be a good idea. And I'm, I'm not making a motion. I'm just thinking 
if someone wants to do it. I, I think that would be fine if we can express, you know, our our realities to him and say, you know, what, you know, where can we go with this? Um, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in that. Um, in my mind, it's already mid-March, and so I don't think we could do anything before that, which means, you know, I, we wouldn't be here. I, but <laughs> I just wanted to plant the seed, and you know, I think that it's it's something that might be useful to some future councils and some future committees. And so, um, if you guys you know go through this process and find that it doesn't seem workable and you can't figure out a way to address some of these challenges, then that's fine. We've talked about it, and um, I won't be offended. <laughs> okay. Well, let's look into that when when we can. So. Talk to the secretary. Great. Okay. So. Thank you all. Uh, all right, I think that wraps up our regular um, business. Uh, so we're going to do some council reports, then we have or in the, um, other reports, and then we're going to have a couple, oh, three, yes, um, three uh, executive session topics. And I don't think we're going to no. be. No, no action. On we any. have no action coming out of that. So, um, in any case, who would like to start with council reports? I'm going to just pick on someone if no one volunteers. Uh, Glenn, would you like to go? Come tomorrow morning to Baguitos. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think that's all I have this week. Thanks. Good, Connor. Uh, scooter survey in the field now, so I uh, should have some stats for you in the coming weeks. Um, also, uh, I, I dropped the ball on this a while ago, but resurrected that uh, sister city committee there. Uh, so I feel like Tom Abdel there will be uh, at the helm of that, working with Harris Webster to hopefully generate some ideas and maybe not too soon, but just have a discussion at council. Nice. Uh, Donna. Uh, we have definitely some people on the transportation committee who'd like to be on the scooters. So people have been asking, just so you know, the interest is there. Sure. Okay. Yeah. To evaluate and okay. Uh, today there was a good meeting despite the weather on the micro transit and there is a lot of research being done with land use as well as marketing and looking at it much more holistically as a demand response. A very interesting group and I think I'm pleased that it's made a lot of progress out of just a narrow focus to be much more expansive of all transit users and all transit systems. So it's good. Cool. Great. Uh, can we swing around to Rosie? Um, I just wanted to use the opportunity to try and pass on some issues that I've been thinking about that I never really got a chance to um, <laughs> to finish up. Um, we approved the uh, certificate of highway mileage today, which made me remember that Ledgewood Terrace is still in a limbo state. Um, this is a street that we have not officially accepted as a city street because of some weird stuff with the developer. Tom McCardle is very knowledgeable about this and it is on his list, but I just want to remind the council of this. I don't want, you know, 50 years from now to have some of those issues that we had earlier this year with a different street. I don't want that to crop up. Um, and so it would behoove the council to um, make sure that this is addressed in the somewhat near future. It's not an urgent issue, but it's one of those things to remember um, and to eventually have it in a place where the city can accept it as an official street. I'm sure the, the residents of Ledgewood Terrace would love to have that solidified. Um, along those same, not, not really the same lines, um, but in the same discussion that I had with, with um, Bill and Tom, um, the city owns a parcel on Berlin Street um, that was a contaminated site that the city ended up um, taking under its control and doing some remediation work. Um, I believe as you're going up Berlin Street, it is kind of that grassy piece of land on the left. Um, and it's just a city-owned piece of land that we've done remediation on um, and, you know, kind of on Tom's non-urgent list. So, you know, he's got lots of urgent things, so I'm not sure that it's a, a high priority, was to kind of look into it and see if there was anything that we could do with it at this point in terms of, you know, has it been um, remediated enough to be able to do something uh, with it. Um, I think it's an intriguing little piece of land because maybe it could be at some point a city park, um, a, a playground or, or something like that. Um, right now we're just mowing it. Um, so 
just passing that on, keeping your brains, um, it would, you know, I'd like to fully utilize all our city resources. And so that's one underutilized potentially city resource. Can you just say where it is again? It's on Berlin Street. Okay. I think we have it currently as number zero Berlin Street okay. because it doesn't have an address. We'll but just, it's like we'll a, be out, the bus shelter. It's like across from 165, 167 in that neighborhood. It used to be called the uh, there was used to be a building there. It was called the Creamery. Huh. Okay. Um, um, up uphill from the if you drive up the hill, there's a there's like a tan. Uh, Ranch house on the left, and where Uncle Levine used to live, and uh, it's just past that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> cool. I'll check that out. So I just Thank wanted you. to put that on your radar. It was something that I'd kind of been in discussions. I'm sure that you know Tom has been swamped with everything else, so it's not a high priority, but um, could be an interesting cool. thing to to work on at some point. Cool. Thank you, Jack. Um. Speaking of Tom being swamped, I've just had had a couple of constituent uh, issues where people have contacted me and had had a complaint or a concern about something. I've uh, forwarded those to the uh, to the manager, and I'm always very impressed by the uh, promptness of the response from the manager and the other uh, department heads. Ashley. Uh, I would echo what Jack said. I, I got some emails that I passed along, and Tom responded and sent very thoughtful responses despite being out completely straight for the last several weeks. Um, and I had another thing, but I forgot. <laughs> OK, fair enough. Um, uh, I'm going to pass. I don't have anything to report. Um, Clerk just left. And clerk just left, so if he wants to come back and afterwards, or when he comes back, he has something to say. Great. Sure. Go um, I don't have a lot. Just to remind you, we are meeting next Wednesday to com continue our conversation from last week. Great. And then I have more to say <laughs> shortly. Uh, okay. I would, uh, hey, I, Tom. Uh, I wonder if we want to just like pop our head in the door right there to see if John has anything to John go oh, see, if, see if John yeah. Odom is there. I would hate to like close the meeting without giving him an opportunity. Well, and he's gonna... Right, and he also he is also keeping the keeping minutes. minutes. So, but if he's not there, you know, then uh, wonder... sounds like he's there. Yeah, I wonder where. We'll he... delay. I'm Thirty seconds here. For <laughs> would you like to? Do you have any report there, sir? Oh, just that early voting is incredibly slow. Come on, everybody, come out. <laughs> but also, I'm glad you meant this certificate of highway mileage. I did not get the original handed to me to pass around, so oh. it just made me think. I always bug people to give me the things. So I just printed out something that I hope will do, which is the image of it. I know you're supposed to send the original. Didn't get it. So I would just pass this around, and maybe everybody can sign it, and I hope it'll be good enough. I hope it works for Tom. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, great. So that is the end of our business or in public session tonight. So um, do we have a motion to go into executive session? I would move that we go into executive session to discuss personnel uh, and real estate, real estate and litigation. Uh, litigation matters uh, pursuant to one VSA section 317 313 A 1E subsection A 1E A2 and A4 there you go there you go is there a second, second? okay there's a second um, uh, all in favor please say aye. aye aye opposed great and we will not be returning to public session we have no action to take all right thank you very much